Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call to order this City Council meeting for Monday, August 28th, 2023. Thank you for joining us here in the Council Chambers. Thanks for everybody watching online this evening. We will start our meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're able, please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thank you to everyone with us this evening. Our first order of business is to approve tonight's agenda. And on the agenda this evening, under our introductory items, we have two proclamations, one for National Suicide Prevention Month and Week, and another for International Overdose Awareness Day. Uh, also under our introductory items, we've got a, a Parade of Homes Spotlight City Award, which I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to hearing more about and receiving. And we'll do our introduction to new employees, uh, is item 2.4. We have uh, 18 items on our consent business this evening. Councilmember Nelson has our consent agenda. Under item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we have a public hearing regarding a city code amendment for murals, our murals ordinance and the supporting policy. And then we have uh, a second item that is not necessarily a public hearing, but we are gonna have a public comment opportunity. And this is as we uh, discuss and uh, hopefully accept our West 98th Street and 35W study report. Under organizational business, we've got three items. Uh, item 5.1 will be an update discussion on cannabis legislation and how it affects the city of Bloomington. Item 5.2 is an update on our 2023 municipal elections, and we will wrap up this evening uh, with item 5.3, our city council policy and issue update. Council, any additions, subtractions, questions about tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda as stated. Second. Motion and a second to uh, accept tonight's agenda. No further discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0, noting that Councilmember Martin is not with us this evening. So we will move on uh, to item two, our introductory items. And as I said, we've got two proclamations. So I'm going to come down to the podium and read our proclamations. As I said, we've got two proclamations this evening, and um, I will just start. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the, the the first one, and then we'll we'll provide some context after we read through the proclamation. And this is a proclamation for National Suicide Prevention Month, which is September 2023, and National Suicide Prevention Week, which is September 10th through the 16th in 2023. Whereas. Suicide is a major public health issue that requires vigilant attention and preventative action with 835 Minnesotans dying by suicide in 2022. And whereas each death by suicide directly impacts numerous family members, friends, loved ones, and by extension, the entire community. And whereas the city of Bloomington is committed to ensuring that those in need have access to services by healthcare providers trained in best practices to reduce suicide risk, and to reducing the stigma associated with using behavioral health treatment or losing a loved one to suicide. And whereas the Bloomington Public Health Division is a member of the Hennepin County Community Health Improvement Partnership, which has identified mental health and well being as a priority for their 2019 2023 strategic plan. And whereas the City of Bloomington recognizes organizations such as Suicide Awareness Voices of Education, the acronym there is SAVE and the Minneapolis VA healthcare systems for their efforts in educating the public and providing services for those at risk. And whereas the month of September is recognized as Suicide Prevention Month, and September 10th through the 16th is recognized across the United States as Suicide Prevention Week. Now therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim September as Suicide Prevention Month and September 10th through the 16th as National Suicide Prevention Week in the city of Bloomington and call upon the people of Bloomington to observe this month and this week by working with your families, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and leaders to become more informed of mental health issues that contribute to suicide. 
signed this day, this 20th day of August 2023. This has become a, uh, an annual proclamation here for the city of Bloomington, and one I think that's very important, and I'm, I'm always honored to, to present it to, uh, to the public. And I do want to uh, take a moment to, to thank our city staff who have worked so hard to promote suicide prevention and, and to reduce the stigma associated with suicide. I want to recognize the staff that have been personally affected by the loss of a loved one due to suicide and for those that have been impacted by attempted suicide or suicide ideation. I'd also like to highlight a few resources this evening. First, a reminder that help is just a call or a text away for anyone in a mental health crisis. Individuals anywhere in this country can call or text 988 for help. The National Council for Suicide Prevention has a campaign called Take Five to Save Lives, which encourages everyone to complete five action steps. The steps fall under the themes of learn, know, do, talk, and share. I invite you to visit the website take5tosavelives.org to get involved. Uh, that's take5, the numeral 5, to save lives.org. You can also tap into resources through the city's website, and you'll find valuable information in the September briefing. And we have uh, a couple of representatives who I'd like to call forward now and possibly say a few things with us this evening. We have virtually, uh, we have Andrea Perry, the Community Engagement and Partnerships Coordinator for Suicide Prevention with the Minneapolis VA Healthcare System. And in person, two folks from SAVE, uh, the Executive Director, Eric Mishy, and Jan Owens, a Senior Program Manager with us this evening. The SAVE office is located right here in Bloomington. I invite you to come forward or, yeah, please, and as I looked around, there you are. Um, and Andrea, if you would like to join us, if, if she's online as well, come on over to the camera. On this side, we'll keep you on camera. Hey, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good evening and welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. tonight. Thank you for having me. Am I okay to start or should I be the second presenter here? Uh, why, don't, why don't we go with uh, number two? You were breaking up for the, just a second there. Why don't we give the uh, uh, the connection time to stabilize a little bit? Why don't we sure. go ahead? Fabulous. Please, thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor. It's, uh, and thank you, City Council, and to the, all the, the staff at, in Bloomington uh, for the opportunity to be here and, and the proclamation. I'm here, as uh, the Mayor mentioned, with uh, our program director, Jen Owens. And every year, uh, we hope that when we have this proclamation that those numbers are lower. But what's important is that every single year we remember that our goal and objective as a society, as an organization, is to raise awareness, to provide education, and to do what we can to save lives and help prevent suicide. And equally important, to also be available to help suicide loss survivors, to provide them with comfort and support, and to continue to reduce and eliminate the stigma of suicide in society. Events like this, proclamations like this, make a big difference in doing that. So on behalf of Jen, all of us at SAVE, our board of directors, and the families and those that you help support, thank you for this. You're very welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. For thank you. This this evening. Thank Jen, you. would you like to say anything? No? You said it perfectly. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Andrew, you go ahead. All right. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Very good. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Andrea Perry. I'm a registered nurse at the Minneapolis VA. And more importantly, I'm on our suicide prevention team. I'm a community engagement partnership coordinator. So what that means is I'm out in the community um, meeting with folks like you all who are interacting with our veterans service members and their families. So we know that veterans are at an increased risk for dying by suicide. They die by suicide 1.5 times more often than their civilian counterparts. Um, so we also know that the majority of our veterans, about two thirds are out in the community and not connected or being seen at VA. And so my role is to educate the community um, that everybody has a role and we all have a role to play in suicide prevention, especially with our veterans. And so by educating you know, local pastors, teachers, um, maybe an employee or, or employer of veterans and then also um, various employees at large companies, small companies, anyone who would interact with a veteran uh, on the tools that it takes to recognize when someone is feeling suicidal or thinking about suicide and how to ask that question and then how to get them to resources. So this is a great opportunity um, and a wonderful movement that Bloomington is making this proclamation this evening. Uh, and I'm very pleased and happy to be working with the Bloomington CARES group and, and team 
to try to bring community suicide prevention efforts for our veterans into Bloomington. Thank you. And thank you, Andrea. And uh, Eric, Dan, thank you for the important work that you do in our community. And when I say community, I know it's much bigger than Bloomington. And I uh, appreciate your, your being here in Bloomington, an important part of our Bloomington uh, resource community and well beyond. So thank you so very thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Especially you know, the proclamation. I'm going to actually bring a quick picture. Oh, you may together. certainly get a quick picture. We're all about quick pictures. you got to do pictures. They're all in, right in the same place. Perfect. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And Andrea, thank you. Thank you for your important work with the VA as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our second proclamation this evening is a uh, also a, a, an equally important and, and timely uh, proclamation that uh, I'm, I'm uh, pleased that we can recognize the uh, International Overdose Awareness Day, which is August 31st, 2023. Whereas drug overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal, continue to impact our nation. And whereas the majority of overdose deaths in the United States involve opioids. And whereas in Minnesota, the number of deaths from opioids overdoses doubled from 2019 to 2021. And whereas in 2022, the Bloomington Police Department responded to 77 overdoses, of which 19 were fatal. And whereas the state of Minnesota has joined in a multi-state settlement intended to combat the opioid crisis at the state and the local level. And whereas the Bloomington Public Health Division is collaborating with stakeholders across Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield to address opioid prevention, rapid response, and treatment needs across the three cities. And whereas the city of Bloomington recognizes resources such as the 988 National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline for people experiencing mental health or substance use crises, and the importance of knowing when and how to access and use Naloxone. I think I said that correctly. And whereas the date of August 31st is recognized as International Overdose Awareness Day. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2023, as International Overdose Awareness Day in the city of Bloomington and call upon the people of Bloomington to observe this day by visiting blm.mn forward slash opioids to learn more about local resources and Bloomington's approach to the opioid crisis. Signed this day, this 28th day of August, 2023. Uh, as I said, a, another very important and timely topic, uh, not only here in Bloomington, but across the Twin Cities and across the state of Minnesota and across the country. And I see Dr. Nick Kelly here this evening. Uh, Dr. Kelly, anything to add to this, to the important work that you're doing? Well, uh, thanks to you and to your staff for your leadership in this, and especially across the three cities that our Department of Health serves. And uh, also, as I said, your, your leadership across the Twin Cities. I know that uh, Bloomington Health Department is recognized by so many others as, uh, as uh, an outstanding resource for a variety of issues and certainly for opioid overdose awareness. So thank you so very much. Item 2.3 on our agenda is a Parade of Homes Spotlight City Award. Mr. Ver Mr. Verbrugge, are you going to introduce this one for us? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, for Housing First Minnesota reached out to us uh, in, in, with the upcoming uh, Parade of Homes that's uh, going to be happening, and they wanted to acknowledge work that the City of Bloomington has been doing. Um, so we want to invite uh, representatives from Housing First uh, to come forward and talk about the... Uh, the spotlight award that they're going to present and thank for them for being here this evening good evening all welcome uh, thank you mr mayor members of the council my name is nick erickson it's a pleasure to be uh, back here again i'm senior director of housing policy for housing first minnesota i'm joined tonight uh, by uh, sarah delong of ron clark construction and tony weiner of cardinal home builders uh, these are two of our home builder members who are doing uh, a lot for our board and through their companies to uh, help america or help minnesotans uh, achieve the dream of home home ownership and that is our uh, central mis mission um, and that's why we're here today uh, we have uh, for the first time ever created the uh, 
Pray to Home Spotlight Community Award. Uh, and this is for uh, to recognize the good work the city of Bloomington is doing to help uh, fulfill our mission of home ownership opportunities for all. Uh, this is part of our 75th anniversary celebration, was the reason to create this award. Uh, Pray to Homes is celebrating 75 years today. And it started at a time uh, which uh, affordable and attainable housing was our organization's central mission following uh, the Second World War. And that is a period of time which is important for Bloomington because that is a period of time which Bloomington and the development community partnered uh, so that uh, you could build your community, new affordable homes, uh, and has created the community that we know today. Um, but as a state, we have lost sight of that goal over the last uh, you know, two decades. And really, the actions you have taken as a council to make uh, Bloomington a home uh, for more uh, Minnesotans by modernizing your zoning policies is really why we're here today. And um, so as part of the 75th anniversary, we wanted to present to you uh, the first ever Blue or Pride of Home Spotlight Award. Well, this is indeed an honor. Thank you so very much for this, and thanks to uh, everyone involved uh, through the Parade of Homes. Uh, we're, we're, we're proud of the work that we've done here in Bloomington, and it's not just the seven of us who sit up here. It's, it's the outstanding staff leadership that we have. It's uh, our folks in, on the executive team. It's our folks working daily on these issues that have, have really made a difference, and um, as I said, it's, it's something that we're proud of. And uh, I know that not only we, but the entire city of Bloomington, every time I bring this up within the community, the work that we've put in, the, the uh, results that we have seen over the past few years, it, it generally generates a round of applause because people understand the importance of home. That without a, a stable and clean and safe home to come home to every night, without that, everything else is, is loose. It all falls apart. But to have that uh, as an anchor, a stability to a person's life in so many different ways. And so we're proud to do it. Thank you so very much for recognizing the work that we've put into it. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks. I'll hand that to you so we don't break it. Thank you. Yeah, no. Item 2.4 on our agenda. We have uh, introduction of some of our new employees this month or this week again. Uh, we've got a couple of different groups here, both from, I think I, it says in my notes, both from finance and IT. Is that correct? Who wants to go first? Amy, why don't you go first? Let's go with uh, IT first. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I'm Amy Cheney. I'm the CIO for the city. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce three new IT employees. First, we have Molly McDonald. Molly started with the city on June 20th. Uh, she is our GIS coordinator, and GIS is Geospatial um, Information Systems. Um, I'm sorry, that's geographical, right? <laughs> okay, I have it on my notes. Um, so um, Molly is responsible for coordinating the implementation of the GIS um, strategic plan for the city, as well as handling um, daily requests from all of our city departments. Uh, she most, most recently worked for the 106 group, where she was the senior GIS analyst, project manager, and process manager. So you can see she only has one title here, so I think she's pretty <laughs> happy about that. Um, Molly holds a degree in environmental studies and political science from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Molly, would you like to say something? Good evening, I'm Molly. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm happy to be here, excited to be working um, at the City of Bloomington and looking forward to collaborating with everyone here. Well, good. We're very glad to have you on board. And even though you have just one job title here, it's a big job. I <laughs> yes. understand that. We, I know, put a lot of emphasis and reliance on our GIS work mm -hmm. within the city. So welcome aboard. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Seth Arndt. Um, Seth joined us on August 14th, and he is our Applications Administrator. 
He'll be involved with implementing and supporting all of the city's um, many software applications. And his most recent experience was with the Minnesota Ar Army National Guard, where he was a network systems operator. And Seth is a recent graduate of Metropolitan State University. Good evening, Seth. Welcome. Yeah, hi. Nice to, nice to meet you guys. Uh, nice to be here. And um, <clears throat> thank you guys for the opportunity to have a position with you. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of the city of Bloomington. Good. And we're very happy to have you. Welcome. And we have James Hahn. Uh, James also joined us on August 14th, but prior to that, he was a contractor with the city uh, as uh, recent as March of this year. He is a desktop support specialist and responsible for end user support and implementing a wide variety of uh, network uh, equipment like laptops, desktops, and mobile devices. Uh, prior to working with the city, he was a virtual reality concierge and IT equipment manager uh, with the REM5 VR lab. And James holds a BA in psychology from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you for, uh, for having me here. This is my first government job, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to work in this environment. Um, during my time here, I've enjoyed working with other members of my team and other members of the city. So looking forward to what's to come. As are we. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Welcome to you all. Thank you. And as I said, I think we've got a couple of folks, at least one or two in finance. Uh, Lori Economy Shoulder. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing um, two individuals that joined finance in July. Nancy LeCoy um, joined the finance team as an accounting assistant in utility billing. Uh, Nancy recently worked for the Lakeville Area Schools for three and a half years as a finance assistant, and prior to that with the Burnsville Egan Savage School District for 18 years. On a personal note, she will become a grandmother for the first time in less than a month. Nancy? <laughs> Good evening, Nancy. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. And I want to say this past month working for the city of Bloomington has been a pleasure. And all of the people that I work with are just very, very gracious and friendly and awesome. Well, good. Well, thanks for, for being here. You are the second person today that I've met who came to us from the Lakefield School District. Really? It's just kind of a fluke. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <There you> go. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. And then I'd like to introduce Erica Lee. Uh, Erica joined um, the finance team as an accountant serving both the city and HRA. Uh, she e eagerly awaited the opening of this position for uh, the past year uh, because she wanted to be more involved in the city in which she lives and its neighboring communities, and she's very grateful to be here. Erica decided she wanted, she wanted to go to the United States at the age of 17 by herself. And then um, and when she came to the United States, then she went to Washington State and started as a freshman in college there. And she later transferred to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where she earned a bachelor degree in quantitative economics. She is currently in the process of obtaining her master's degree in accounting while working full time for us. Hmm. And then prior to joining the city, Erica honed her accounting skills and finance skills at a regional CPA firm. In that capacity, she worked with clients across the country, doing financial statement review, offering business consultation, and handling tax preparation by directly managing a team of nine staff. And during her free time, she enjoys playing the violin and is preparing to audition for the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra. Um, <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council members. It's very nice to meet you, and I really want to um, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to work for City of Bloomington. Um, everyone has been really nice, and I'm very much enjoying my time here. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Nancy, Erica, welcome. Thanks for being with us this evening. Thanks for joining us here in the City of Bloomington. We will move on in our agenda to item three, which is our consent business. Uh, Councilmember Nelson has the consent agenda tonight, and I think we've got at least a couple of things that we we need to talk about. Uh, Councilmember, did Councilmember Nelson yeah. uh, uh, hold holds that you have heard about um, uh, three point two and three point one five, and th that was all. I uh, the the other thing that uh, I am just going to to mention here. Because of uh, my 
uh, relationship with a competitor of Polder Semiconductor. Item 3.12, if anybody has questions on that, I am going to step away and turn over the uh, mayoral duties to Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, if, uh, and I will step away and, and wait for the vote to happen. If nobody has questions on that, what I'm gonna do is just, uh, and we, it goes to a vote, what I'd like to do is hold it so I can abstain from voting on that. All right, so uh, item 3.12, uh, you can mark down as a, as a hold as well, but we'll just vote on that individually so I have the opportunity to abstain for that. Okay. All right. Sounds good, Mayor. Not hearing anything else, I would move item 3133 through 311, 313 and 314, and 316 through 318. I got 32 held, yeah. Uh, second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to accept tonight's consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 3.2. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, if I could, there were several questions that came in and I'd like a little bit more time to uh, provide some uh, additional uh, explanation, so I'd like to hold this item until September 18th. If that's okay with the council, just a motion to continue to the next council meeting, please. So moved. Second. So we have a motion to continue item 3.2 on tonight's consent business. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Um, I would move uh, item 3.12. Second. We have a motion and a second on item 312. Any council discussion on this? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And I will abstain. So motion carries 5 0 with Bussy abstaining on item 312. And then 315 was Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. I just, um, I had a quick question on this. I didn't know if we knew what the application uh, grant like n the, what the number was that we were um, shooting for? Do we happen to know that number? Or is it just we apply and then they tell us what we're gonna get? I di it didn't say, so I was curious. I am I am not sure, do we have? I didn't Rue, prepare or anybody for I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. 3.15, the, yeah. the relief forestry grant proposal. You're asking for a resolution, but I didn't know what we were trying to apply for, That um, the, what the number was. I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, Assistant City Manager Sable. Uh, Did I miss Sable? It? Mayor, Councilmember, Councilmember D'Alessandro, it's up to $500,000. Oh, are we going for the maximum, I assume? Or is it just like we we tell them what we want and then they tell us how much they're going to give us? Um, without no, without speaking on behalf of another agency, they're going to tell us what we're going to get, yeah, but okay. we'll seek Great. the maximum. Great. <laughs> I just wanted to call attention to it. I, I, I've, been, um, I've had no less than a dozen conversations in the past week about trees. Um, some people are upset because their trees are dying and they can't like get them down fast enough and they're becoming dangerous because they may die and then fall over and hurt people. Um, other people have told me that, you know, they're unable to afford it. So we go by and, and mark the tree and they get 30 days and then, and then we're supposed to come by and get them and assess them for it. But then we don't even have enough resources to do that. Point I'm making is, um, and I think I, you know, we can carry this over to, um, our business items at 0 0.5, uh, 5.0, so I'll do that. Um, but I just wanted to call attention. Um, anything we can do like this is great, and so I'm really appreciative that the, that the staff is looking for all of these kinds of things to help us with our, our problem right now. So Agreed completely. With, with that, I'm very happy to move 3.15. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Nelson to uh, accept item 3.15 on the consent business. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries Six zero. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Well done. We'll move on to item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. Item 4.1 is our only official public hearing of the evening, and this is regarding a city code amendment regarding murals, ordinance, and supporting policy. And I think we have uh, Mr. Nick Johnson from our planning staff via WebEx and Glenn Markegaard here in person if we, uh, if we run into any technical glitches. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Good evening, Nick. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me share my slides here. Everybody see that okay? Yes, we can. Great. I'll get started here. 
So, uh, yeah, before you this evening, we're presenting uh, both an ordinance and a supplemental policy document uh, as they pertain to the installation of murals in Bloomington. Uh, by way of background, uh, the city with the formation of the Creative Placemaking Commission and uh, um, uh, adding the director has become more involved in the commissioning and installation of murals over the last few years. Uh, there's more interest in them. Um, by way of background in terms of how we got started down this path of working on a murals uh, policy, uh, we were doing study sessions with both the City Council and the Planning Commission on our upcoming sign ordinance uh, project, which is still ongoing. Um, and as part of that initial study session item, uh, currently murals are very much embedded in the, in the sign ordinance, and that's why it was raised as part of that, uh, those study session items. Uh, and there was universal uh, support from both bodies in order to pursue policy uh, within the city code to make the installation of murals um, uh, more favorable in terms of less removing some of the barriers that exist. So really in terms of the official start of this, it really went back to January. The more we dug into murals, uh, we were planning to just incorporate changes to murals as part of our broader sign ordinance update. Um, but the more we dug into it, the more we realized it was actually a, a separate matter. Um, they do, uh, those two things do need to speak to one another, but really it's a separate policy matter uh, that, that uh, necessitated its own uh, ordinance and uh, supplemental policy. So that's really where it started was those study sessions back in January. Um, since then, we've been working on our standards and we've taken it through uh, our advisory boards, both Creative Placemaking and the Planning Commission. So we've been going through this process on the dates on the screen before you there. Uh, one other thing I want to add is that we did, um, as we're doing with the signed ordinance, we did consult with an expert legal counsel at Green Espel, John Baker. Um, because murals and signs uh, have so much uh, legal considerations with respect to expression and some of the sticky wickets that uh, relate to land use law, uh, we did want to get uh, feedback from uh, this expert counsel um, in these matters of expression and First Amendment law. So I do want to point that out, that that did occur before the Planning Commission public hearing. Um, before I go forward, too, I want to note that Kevin Toski is on the call as well as Alejandra Palinka. Um, so should you have questions about either the legal components or the uh, creative placemaking components, they're uh, in support uh, of me here on the call as well. So here we are at the uh, city council uh, public hearing. In terms of the approach to this policy, it's a little bit um, out of the ordinary in that we're proposing both a uh, city code amendment, so the ordinance itself, and then a supplemental policy. This follows a successful, uh, a successful approach that we have with our landscaping uh, provisions. And the reason that we're proposing to pursue it in this manner is that there's a lot of elements of murals that really are more discretionary or best practices in nature something that you do want property owners and installers uh, or artists to consider, but don't necessarily want to embed uh, as hard and fast within the city code. So this is really an approach where you, you adopt uh, the hard and fast rules within the city code through an ordinance and then have this supplemental policy as a means to help administer the permit program uh, as well as communicate these best practices uh, to installers in terms of just installation and maintenance and other things. Um, there's some design standards in there too, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. In terms of the mural ordinance content itself, uh, I'm going to go over uh, specifically the items that are bold here on your screen. I certainly can take questions at the end if there's any uh, specifics about the ordinance, um, but we'll just kind of dig right into that. We are proposing to uh, adopt a new definition of murals, replacing the existing definition. One thing I want to highlight here uh, is just that uh, with the city's coatings prohibition, we do want to note in our definition that a uniform painting, painting or coating of an exterior surface does not constitute a mural. And that in addition, this is something separate and distinct from uh, graffiti as defined in city code, which is uh, um, applications or etching or markings that happen without the property owner's consent as opposed to uh, other artwork. So the, getting to the uh, exterior materials uh, standards and our coding restrictions, so this is really the heart of the matter in terms of the, the greatest barriers within city code uh, that relate to the installation of murals on buildings. The city code uh, prohibits coatings, so painting on primary materials. And then there's actually explicit language that uh, does not allow murals to be installed directly on the exterior surface of a building. So both of these things need to um, be addressed in order to allow murals to go forward in Bloomington. 
Um, the way that we are approaching it is that uh, if a mural uh, was approved via a permit process um, uh, administratively, then that would in effect create an exemption uh, to the city's uh, coding uh, prohibition. So hopefully that makes sense uh, and we think it um, honors, uh, still honors the codings uh, policies of the city of Bloomington, but allows this pathway forward for murals. Getting into prohibited mural types, this is kind of the area where the, uh, the legal considerations come most into play uh, in terms of expression. Uh, I don't wanna beat around the bush that uh, if you adopt a murals policy and you allow uh, folks to install murals on their buildings, there is a wide array of expression that they can uh, pursue uh, legally um, that the city would not be in a p position to prohibit just on the basis of First Amendment considerations. This will come up with signs later on uh, this year as well. Um, but there are some elements of uh, expression that uh, the courts have upheld uh, do need to be regulated for uh, public peace and safety. So I do want to highlight this list of prohibited mural types uh, and note that uh, John Baker with Green Aspel reviewed this as well as our, uh, our legal department as well. So imitating official uh, traffic signs and devices, that's clearly a, a, a can be a concern with vehicles passing a, a murals. Um, obscuring or concealing life safety equipment. So uh, this was important to the fire department that a mural not obscure uh, the equipment they need in order to respond uh, to a safety situation. Um, fire department connections, strobes, other equipment like that. And then this gets more into the expression components. So inciting or producing imminent lawless action, uh, conveying threats of violence at persons or groups, and then sexual conduct or conduct in a patently offensive way. Um, so those are the things that uh, the Supreme Court uh, have upheld uh, restriction or regulation of uh, just from an expression First Amendment uh, perspective. There we go. Sorry, screen froze there for a second. Uh, so in terms of general standards, I'm only going to highlight one of these. Certainly we can return to these if there are questions, but um, uh, the, the one of greatest uh, interest to the Planning Commission and uh, one that maybe is the um, uh, most relevant to, to discuss here tonight is just limiting the amount of a building that could uh, be eligible for mural installation. Uh, we're proposing a maximum of 50% of the total building elevations. Um, and that's that, you know, provides an adequate canvas. It allows for, uh, you know, a fairly large mural in many cases to be installed, uh, but also um, uh, does provide some boundaries uh, in terms of honoring still the coding restriction, but also just the maintenance considerations for a building going forward. Um, the 50% number, we went back and forth with creative placemaking and other uh, folks quite a bit on that. Um, we think it represents the best kind of balance point um, of where to go with that one. Other standards, height, projection, signage, lighting, uh, motion and flashing, some of these things very much are in line with uh, what we'll, we plan to bring forward to you as part of our sign ordinance. While they are separate, they both are expression. We do wanna have some um, uh, syncing up or uh, some consistency between those policies. In terms of maintenance, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but the, the key considerations in the ordinance is to give staff the tools uh, needed to ensure that uh, a mural, if it were to fall in a state of disrepair, uh, give us the tools in order to seek correction of that uh, situation. So we do have the uh, applicants submit a plan, maintenance plan. We do require a minimum level of maintenance and then uh, do set out kind of timelines for uh, correction if a mural were to fall into a state of disrepair. The supplemental uh, policies and procedures document, as I noted, uh, it's really the, um, the, the intent there is a couple fold is one just to lay out kind of some of the um, uh, permit uh, procedures in terms of what you have to submit within your application and some of these other elements. Um, and then also just uh, communicating some design standards and, and best practices. Again, not necessarily something you wanna have embedded in the city code, uh, but still good to communicate um, uh, to folks who are interested in pursuing a mural. So as I noted, Creative Placemaking and Planning Commission both reviewed this policy on multiple occasions. They both were very supportive. Um, uh, the Creative Placemaking Commission uh, did submit a letter of support. It was within your packet on the policy and the Planning Commission held a public hearing on August the 3rd. Uh, no one spoke at the meeting um, or during the hearing, I should say. And uh, following discussion, the Planning Commission did unanimously uh, recommend approval. So with that, I do have a uh, proposed motion language and I'm happy to take any questions you might have on this policy. 
Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate it. Uh, council questions, and, and I do have a question. Under your general standards, specifically it says under area limited to 50% of entire building. Uh, the biggest mural we have in the city of Bloomington is not on a building. It's on a wall. Uh, and, and I've also seen some pretty effective murals painted on, on streets, for example, or, or parking lots. How is, is, that, is limiting it to and, and specifying entire building elevation wall, I mean, is that, is that the correct way to define and limit the area that, that may be painted or, or maybe used for a mural? Yeah, Mayor, thank you for that question. I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. So this provision, staff would interpret that only to be applicable to buildings. So those are um, structures that have, you know, four season conditioned uh, space. So screen walls, um, other infrastructure out in the uh, public right of way, um, that this, this provision would not be applicable to that. So um, uh, in terms of limiting it to 50%, you know, on, uh, let's say at the Excel, um, at the Northeast Excel substation there, um, this, this uh, provision would not be applicable because uh, it is strictly applicable to buildings. So then there would be no general standards applied to a screen wall like that? At this point, no. Okay. So as, as currently proposed, we would not limit um, uh, those miscellaneous structures in that way. Got it. Thank you. Council questions? Council Member D'Alessandro? Just a quick, actually a quick follow-up question on the same topic, if I may. Please. Why do we care? Like, I, I, honestly, like I, I feel sometimes like we artificially limit our, like, these kinds of things. And I, I didn't understand the justification for no more than 50% other than, like, somebody said that. But I don't, I guess I don't understand, like, the practical implication of that. If, if I'm a, um, an owner of a building and I want the entire thing on one side to be a mural, like, why do I care? Like, why do we care? I guess, I don't know, I, is there a reason? Uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Johnson answer that, although the way this is written, the way I'm reading it, it's limited to 50% of an entire building elevation. So if you're thinking four walls, you know, you could completely paint or completely mural two of them, right? Or, you know, I, I think that that would be 50% of the four walls. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Johnson, what's the justification to me, for the sir, 50%? Yeah, Mayor, Councilmember Del Sandro, thank you for that question. I think there's some uh, members of the Planning Commission who uh, concur with you uh, in, on your assessment of that. And if I can explain a little bit in terms of what the thinking was on some limitation. One is just the simple fact of the, um, the codings prohibition. And so uh, staff on some level felt that uh, going, going towards a full mural um, of an entire building could be a potential way to circumvent the codings prohibition or makes that policy more tenuous uh, from the perspective of maintaining that uh, position. The second thing just had to do more with general maintenance, uh, with the ability to install murals on uh, the full entirety of a building. It just sets a very, uh, a much larger, higher maintenance responsibility on the property owner. And there was some discussion and questions at the Planning Commission about, um, you know, the, uh, the sale or the um, uh, sale of buildings that had uh, murals. So from that perspective, it was just seen as a way to kind of uh, limit the proportionality um, as it relates to maintenance, but also just the, um, uh, you know, how much uh, kind of a new owner would be assuming from a responsibility standpoint. So it's certainly an area that the city could go in a different direction. I will say that the Planning Commission did want uh, to be kept in the loop or informed if any building owner did want to install more than 50% because it seemed like something they were very open of uh, removing or going uh, or increasing that uh, proportionality. Okay, thank, thank you for that. I, a quick follow-up question to, uh, related to another comment I had um, based on what you just said there as well. So in transferring ownership from building A to building B, is there anything that we're, uh, that we're requiring the new building owner, you, you mentioned maintenance, but if the building owner wanted to completely paint over the mural, is that their right then as the new building owner? Is there anything related to, I guess, to the public art aspect of a mural that we are trying to preserve? Yeah, member, uh, Mayor Councilmember Del Sandro, thank you for the question again. So um, in terms of what the responsibility would be of the new owner, it would be to keep the mural in a state of good repair. If they wanted to go away from that mural, the way the policy is set up now is to try and work with staff 
to uh, arrive at some type of way to remove the mural or to restore the exterior uh, exterior material of the building uh, in a way uh, that um, uh, ranging from a certain level of different outcomes. One potentially could be repainting. That's not staff's number one preference just on the basis of the coatings prohibition, but there are other means and methods in order to do that. And so staff's expectation would be is that they would be working, uh, a property owner be working with staff, say if a mural fell into a state of disrepair and didn't want to replace it, um, then that they would look at some of those other means and methods uh, prior to the last uh, point of no return being kind of just repainting uh, over it. But there's solvents, there's sandblasting, there's kind of more powerful pressure washing situations um, in some certain, you know, obviously these things have different ranges of cost associated with them. So we would want to try and work with people as best we can. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of questions. Just for clarification, um, the permit would be issued just based on the standards. There's no aesthetic review of it. You know, they wouldn't be up to the manager to say, eh, I really don't like this mural. It would be just based on these standards. And I got that question from someone who does murals. They just wanted to confirm that. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Nelson, that's correct. Uh, the city would not be in any uh, good position, legally speaking, to uh, be looking at the content beyond those five things that I mentioned in the prohibited uh, mural types. Anything else like that, getting into aesthetic tastes, uh, we would not be in sound standing to make any type of judgment or uh, action on a mural permit on those basis, and um, we, we just wouldn't go there. Um, so that's why I mentioned if, you know, these types of policies, if you're opening the door to more expression, um, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the car you're buying, uh, for lack of a better term. All right. The second question has to do with safety. What, uh, tools might we have if there's a safety issue? And, and I bring this up because, um, some of you may remember in the mid nineties, there was a mural in Chicago that caused, uh, extraordinary traffic problems on the freeway. Um, and some accidents. It was a uh, Dennis Rodman was on the side of a building and I happened to drive through Chicago frequently at that time. So, um, do we have anything we could do if somebody put something up that, I mean, there were literally people stopping on the freeway and blocking traffic to take a photo of it. Um, do we have any tools or options if there's something that is that much of a, a public nuisance and creating a hazardous situation? Again, I mean, that was 25 years ago, and so it seems like there's other murals, and maybe it's not the biggest problem in the world, but um, I do recall it being quite a big to-do at the time. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Nelson, thank you for that question. So the the Dennis Radman uh, thing threw me for a loop for what it, that was not what I was expecting that to be. <laughs> um, but but um, uh, in our prohibited mural types, we do have uh, a things that are called out that do uh, confuse uh, motor vehicle operators uh, view just from a traffic perspective. So um, I guess if there was a, a mural at a, a high volume roadway along a high volume roadway. Uh, we certainly would bring in our traffic staff to have them look at it just to uh, get their take on um, whether or not uh, the mural would appear to intimate any official traffic sign or uh, be a concern from a, tra a traffic safety hazard standpoint. We also have, in addition to that, so in, in number three, uh, we also do have uh, murals that uh, could produce imminent lawless uh, action. Now, um, that's kind of a broad category, but we had to be specific in terms of, uh, you know, the things that have been upheld by the Supreme Court with respect to First Amendment. Um, so I think for us to take the action of denying a mural permit on that basis, we would want to uh, get it well vetted and well uh, reviewed on the part of staff, the many different departments of staff who might have uh, a uh, feedback on whether or not the, the proposed mural violates one of these five uh, proposed uh, prohibited mural types because the courts have been uh, pretty strong against cities regulating content. Yeah. And my last question relates to that content question. Um, you know, one of the things that Bloomington doesn't have are billboards. And is this a way with buildings and the side of buildings, particularly adjacent to freeways to sort of circumvent that? I know there are some prohibitions with regards to logos and branding and things like that, but there's probably, in my mind, other um, speech and images and things like that that could go there. Is, is that a concern that you have? Is this a way that people would be able to 
as an example, put up a political message or something of that nature on the side of a building in a high traffic area? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Nelson, non-commercial speech is always going to be a little bit trickier than uh, commercial speech. And the reason I say that is that um, within the ordinance itself, we're proposing a 10% limitation on, you know, the elements of a uh, mural that can constitute a sign. So there is that size limitation there. The sign ordinance, of course, would also have separate and uh, parallel uh, limitations on size of commercial messages, things that clearly under our definitions would be a sign. Um, so those things are those things are helpful. The other thing I'd say is that the sign ordinance does now and will continue in the future in our draft um, limit uh, off premises signs. Um, so those are things that can eliminate, you know, a lot of the, the driver for billboards, billboards mostly for the um, uh, standpoint or off premises signs, right? They're advertising products or services that don't, that, uh, that, that well, there is no building associated with the billboard. So, but they're typically advertising things that don't exist in that area. The one that you bring up in terms of either a political message or some other form of non commercial speech, that is a little bit uh, trickier, uh, certainly. Um, and that's something that we'll have to uh, work with our legal staff um, on continuing to monitor. Um, but yes, uh, there is limitations within the policy on signage. You can't have off-premises signage. So just because you're a commercial business doesn't mean you can advertise a product or a service that you don't effectively have there. Um, the non-commercial speech does get stickier. Sure. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, I'll just pick up right where my uh, my colleague left off there. Um, so uh, if something were to go up, um, what protections uh, does the uh, city have? And I just have a couple of examples I had a question about to see if they're, you know, just so I, for understanding. Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Lohman. So uh, on the front end of things before we would issue a permit, so um, that's where we would be reviewing uh, whether or not the content violates any of those five elements of the prohibited mural types. And that's, you know, that's where we really need to kind of stop it in its tracks. Um, so uh, if it goes up and let's say we somehow miss it, you know, um, and the public catches on and says, hey, what about, what about this? What would we be able to do at that point? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, I, I mean, not fully understanding the nature of the complaint on the part of the public or um, what the concern is. If it's a safety uh, issue, that's that's one thing that um, we would certainly work with them to address. If it's if it's a concern about just content generally, um, you know, I don't like this particular work of art for X, Y, Z. I don't I don't think the city would be in a good position to uh, have them remove that or effectuate a different outcome. I see Kevin's at the podium as well. And I see uh, Ms. Mandershad has moved her microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh, Mayor, members, uh, Kevin can certainly weigh in, but it sounds to me like if it's a private mural, there's going to be a private right of action against the property owner, you know, be it a copyright or a logo infringement or. Um, if somebody was misusing um, somebody's um, facial representation or something like that, there are lots of private remedies. Kevin, you want to add anything more? Yeah, um, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, um, there's criminal nuisance too, and that would have more to do on the effect it has on drivers, pedestrians, neighboring property owners, things like that. I'll say the case law I've looked at is kind of, there's not a lot out there on that theory of prosecuting criminally. There's a criminal nuisance statute in state law in chapter 609, but you know, we'd have to document exactly what was going on, make sure we did that, and then you could try to prosecute based on that. But like I said, the case law is scant on that. So that's one theory. There's also private nuisance actions uh, where a neighbor property owner could say, hey, this is so bad that it's affecting my property. My people don't want to come to my building. Um, that would be available through private action. So there's those two things, um, public versus private, um, private a little easier than public to do probably so you know sometimes murals don't uh age with time and sometimes you find out things are offensive you know at times that's the only reason why i asked that and then the other question just so i understand uh so for example if you have a nude human being would, would that be prohibited to do something you can do help me just to, so i understand and then the other one i had is let's say the person's you know smoking a cigarette or some other illegal substance or drinking alcohol is that something that you know as long as it's not um, 
you know, maybe it's part of a scene or something like that that's going on. You know, is that something that's legal to do? Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Lohman. Um, I have seen that in other ordinances uh, with murals and signage, um, depictions of illegal activities. I don't like that. Um, I think it goes a little bit too broad um, for, you know, what the Supreme Court has said is unprotected. I think it delves a little too far because the court will look at that and say, hey, you're you're overbroad here. You're doing a little bit but too much. But you'd be much. able to do it, though, is what you're saying. You'd I've seen other to... cities do it, yeah. So, well, I mean, I'd say, but you'd be able to, let's say, with the way that ours is written today, you could put that on a mural and we wouldn't be able to stop it, right? Correct, Councilmember Lohman, yes. Okay, I just want to just be, be sure that I understood yep. that. And then, Mary, I just had one last question. Um, <clears throat> and I don't, this is a, a completely different thing. Uh, as I also thought the same way as my, my colleague over here, <laughs> um, uh, D'Alessandro, about this idea of this 50%, uh, um, and, and you know, what is it that we're trying to drive at or what is it we're trying to achieve? And I kind of look at our, you know, our mission and our vision statement about trying to be a remarkable and cultivating a, you know, a remarkable uh, community. And, and I kind of wonder, you know, if that kind of, you know, is that a way for us to, if we run into a situation where it's over the 50%, you know, or it's under the 50% of us trying to control it, I'm just trying to figure out what's the rationale behind that, uh, of that 50%. And, and, Certainly, I could go along with it today, but I think we need to kind of think about that. Um, I mean, uh, if that's something we really want to kind of, kind of keep that going. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it today, but uh, I, I can't uh, really come up with a good reason why 50% makes sense. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, my, my question is along that same line of uh, recourse that the city would have, uh, especially recourse – if we issue the permit, there's really nothing we can do, right? Once it goes up and we've issued it and approved it, if 90% of the residents or the, the area around them are, are complaining about it, the only pathway they have is a, a public or, or, or private recourse. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that correct? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, M Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Mua, uh, um, that would be correct. They would have a private, you know, a neighboring property owner could have a private cause of action. Um, and it would depend on the, the effect on the public, right? Um, if people just don't like the message or the content, it would be a little harder. But if it's really causing, you know, people to damage property or have a really negative reaction, the city might be able to take action at that point. It would just depend on the circumstances. So it gets muddy, I would say. Okay. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, second question, if, if I could, Mayor. Um, I, I read in the, 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 the presentation, this isn't limited to certain zoning, correct? So this could happen anywhere in the city. Could be residential house, could be commercial district. Um, would love to just hear more about that rationale. Uh, I know we have very broad, spread out commercial areas. We don't have one distinct downtown area. Um, but just would love to hear more of that rationale, especially uh, because we are such a large residential city. Um, how that could impact certain neighborhoods and their character and that kind of thing. Yeah, Mayor, Councilmember Mua, um, thanks for that question. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. So um, you're correct in that some cities do limit the ability to install murals to, a, say, a downtown uh, CBD, you know, business district uh, type setup. As you noted, um, Bloomington's land use and uh, uh, commercial enterprises are kind of uh, scattered throughout the whole community. So. Um, so that's kind of one thinking behind that, you know, our industrial sites, our uh, commercial sites, all of these may have interest in uh, pursuing a mural. In terms of why not to restrict them from residential districts, um, it's kind of a nuance more of maybe Bloomington zoning code, but a lot of non-residential uses are allowed in our residential districts, including uh, government facilities, fire stations, parks, places of assembly, and so our thinking in terms of not to include a locational uh, restriction on it uh, was that, you know, there could be a scenario we would we could envision that uh, one of these types of uses would be interested in uh, pursuing a mural. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, single family homes or other, or other residential uses, uh, uh, many of those are actually, there is, is not a coding prohibition on those sites today. So in effect, absent this proposed policy, um, there's there's no uh, regulation currently on uh, if a resident wanted to install a mural uh, on their home. Um, you know, should this were to pass, then they would have to pursue the same uh, mural permit process. 
um, as anyone else. Um, the you could consider um, uh, um, you know limiting uh, mural installation to kind of non-residential buildings in the uh, residential zoning districts. Um, but again, it's just how far do you want to go, and um, you know, it, are, are murals inappropriate at all residential sites? I don't know, but that's definitely a policy decision that the council uh, should make. Uh, one more follow-up on that. So, uh, because we have no regulation currently, if someone had something that would qualify as a mural on their home today, and we pass this ordinance, would they have to come and apply for a permit, or would they be grandfathered into? The, the previous ordinance that we didn't have. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Mua, they would not have to retroactively uh, pursue a mural permit process, nor would they be subject to the uh, performance standards within the proposed uh, ordinance and policy. Yeah, they'd be legally non-conforming or just conforming. Council, additional questions? Do not hear any. I don't know where I put my motion sheet. So uh, what I will do, I'm going to open up the public hearing on item 4.1. This is item 4.1, a public hearing on the city code amendment regarding murals, ordinance, and supporting policy. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Mike, Mr. Sable, is there anyone on from the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.1? Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, no one is on the phone. Last call for anybody in the chambers. We've got no one in the chambers coming forward. We've got nobody on the phone. Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing at in 4.1. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to close the public hearing at in 4.1 this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, so what are your thoughts on this? I've, I've heard a couple of folks who indicate perhaps that 50% is a bit restrictive. Um, I, I think if we'd want to bump that up, uh, I don't know if it would be appropriate to maybe uh, table this, send it back to the Planning Commission to get their feedback on this as well, because they, didn't, they did pass this with the 50%, although I think Mr. Johnson said that they were open to the conversation of 100%. Um, uh, thoughts on this? How, how, how would we like to move forward? Uh, is there enough... Uh, enough of a desire to eliminate the limit of 50% of an entire building elevation wall area. Councilmember Lohman? Well, yeah, I mean, I haven't heard a rationale as to why we should keep it. I mean, you know, anything more than, you know, 50 or 60 or, or 20% or, I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand why we'd want to keep it. So yeah, I think it's worth having a, a, an additional conversation about that. There's a couple other items I would like to see us look at too as well. Uh, Councilmember Moore brought up brought up one of them as well. So. No, I, I would think the only the only possible thing, given the, the conversation as it progressed here, limiting it to 50 percent, if it is a, in a residential area, if it's someone's home, and they put some sort of wacky uh, work of art, a mural on their entire house, does it affect the property values of the of the neighbors? You know, does, I I don't know it. Uh, art and murals like any other art I mean it's kind of in the eye of the beholder and so I don't know if if we could make that argument or not or if even that's something we'd want to consider but I would think that would be that would be in terms of justification I don't know if there's anything other than that uh, but th that would be a possibility Councilmember D'Alessandro would there uh, Mr. Mayor thank you would there be a, a, a maybe a better way to um, address that would be um, to apply that standard to a certain zone like R1 and then you don't have it on the other places so to your point you would kind of effectively solve the problem in a more residential area if you thought the 50% threshold was for that purpose and then you would have all the other areas wouldn't have that restriction I don't know I mean I, I think I think ultimately we, we have signs today like people people are not prohibited today from hanging signs from their home. There's a really offensive one in District 3 today <laughs> that's been up there since around about 2020. <laughs> and, you know, they have every right to have it on their property. And so, you know, um, I don't know if it was Voltaire or whoever, but you can disagree with what somebody says, but you defend their right to say it, right? And um, this is free speech. So that that's the only, that's one of the main reasons I was kind of uncomfortable with the restriction. It just seemed kind of arbitrary and restrictive for 
not a good reason. But if if we want to do that, maybe we maybe we put that restriction on a on a permit basis based on zone or something like that to kind of minimize that impact. That'd be a, an option for us. Thank you. And I, I, I can imagine the administrative and legal headaches that would come if we would keep the 50%, but throw in there somehow a an appeal process. If somebody wanted to come forward and say, nope, we want to go 75 or 100% with review by the city. Um, I, I don't know that that would be enforceable or, or advisable. Ms. Mandershad, thoughts? I'm, Mayor members, I'm just trying to think through what the objective criteria might possibly be that would uh, create some sort of neutral objective decision by staff on what would sort of elevate somebody to be able to go 75 or 100%. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe it's creating more problems than it's solving to, to look at it that way. Um, Councilmember Carter? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would be comfortable um, sending this back to the Planning Commission to get their opinion on eliminating the okay. 50%. Uh, I don't know if I would be comfortable um, having certain requires and requirements in residential areas because we don't currently have those requirements. And so um, it seems like we're, um, you know, creating something that maybe not isn't quite, it isn't needed, right? And so um, I don't think I would want to go that route, but, um, but I am open to um, revisiting or having the Planning Commission revisit the maximum area of 50%. Councilmember Del Sandro. Yep, um, um, I do believe it, it, Nick might have said this. I think, um, but they said um, they had talked about it. They were fine passing it, and they were like, "Hey, let us know if somebody comes and says it's too restrictive, and then maybe we change it or whatever mm -hmm. too." So that's another option is to to get the you know l allow the creative placemaking folks the wherewithal to start some of the projects they want to start uh, potentially. If 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 they I know they put in a letter of support, so maybe they have some things in the works that are currently you know, kind of stuck behind us not having this um, this ordinance kind of or organized, if you will. I don't know if that's true or not, but th is anybody able to speak to if we're if we did send it back, are we delaying some things that the Creative Placemaking Commission might want to get underway? I, I, that I don't know, uh, and and I want to be clear that the, the notion of sending it back would be I, we don't need to, we're not required to. I think it's more of a, mm -hmm. a courtesy kind of thing to get the uh, Planning Commission's thoughts on it. But if, if this council would like to eliminate that 50% limit, we could certainly do that on our own. And Mr. Mayor and Council Members D'Alessandro, I'm not aware of anything in the pipeline for the Creative Placemaking Commission, but maybe Mr. Johnson, if you have additional info. Thank you, uh, Mr. Verbrugge. Um, it looks like Alejandro Palenka is on the line to maybe confirm that, but I do have a uh, kind of a second follow-up to that, but Alejandra, did you want to speak to that? Yes, hello, Mayor, hello, Council Members. Um, there are a couple of projects that we are interested in pursuing, but this wouldn't delay any of those from being implemented. So there's nothing currently that's in the pipeline. Thank you, that helps clarify. Thank you. And, and Mayor, if, if I may just provide one last feedback in Please. terms of the nature, the nature of the Planning Commission discussion, I, I mean, I think it wasn't, it, I w wouldn't describe the 50% uh, limitation as something that they were strongly in favor of. I think the, the discussion broke down a kind of, you know, a 4-3, you know, right down the middle kind of way. And I, I would look to Ms. Manderscheid in terms of whether or not it's appropriate to send it back. But I think that there was definitely a willingness on their part, and I, and I don't intend, mean to speak for them, but a willingness to look for, look at that. But in terms of just the nature of the discussion and kind of why staff was uh, looking at that is that I very much think of this something as like a crawl, uh, walk, run kind of thing. Right now, we don't allow murals at all. It's just completely prohibited. Um, and so this was seen as just a way to kind of, you know, uh, dip our feet in the water and get started. Um, and they, what they asked us to do is continue to track um, if, if this should, if this provision becomes a problem, we want to change it uh, moving forward in the future. Um, and just from working with Alejandra Palinka, 
um, and others, uh, we, we felt that the 50%, while that number seems somewhat restrictive, uh, it was kind of consensus reach amongst our group that, you know, well over 90% or 95% of the des desired murals would, would not have no problem, uh, uh, you know, abiding by that. Uh, restriction mural installation is actually you know very expensive and so to do a full building um, uh, would be would be a unique uh, situation councilmember Loman so just um, <clears throat> you know maybe this is more place making piece but I thought we had at one point uh, some of the utility boxes that we were were painting with murals on them was that at 50 percent or is that a hundred percent when we were doing that Hello, council members, mayor, I can answer that. This is Alejandra Palenka. And yes, utility boxes were 100% wrapped. Um, they are the smaller utility boxes that we typically either paint or wrap with a vinyl wrap. And yes, they are completely covered typically. Sometimes not the top, but yeah, usually they are. Okay, but it's mostly, and so that's sort of, you know, mayor, kind of what I'm thinking about when I think about this. I mean, of course, a utility box is totally different than a building. I totally get that. I'm not saying a utility box is the same as a, as a building, but, um, you know, when I thought about that um, and I think about this, um, that's where I sort of kind of have the question, you know, you know, what are we trying to attempt to do here? You know, do, do we, are we, are we in favor of letting murals, you know, kind of happen and take place here or are we, um, you know, want to kind of slow walk our way into this. So um, I, I, don't, I personally think that, you know, I can't hurt to send it back to, to planning to have, have a look at that. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> um, I am just a little more interested in some of these, um, you know, what do we do uh, if something offensive gets up there and we somehow learn about that? And uh, uh, how do we how do we address that? I really want to have a solid, you know, I mean, maybe it will never happen, but... Uh, but I'd hate to not have that discussion or um, look at that a little more seriously um, uh, before we go ahead and do this, especially if we go beyond 50%. Yeah. And, and that goes back to my point about the notion of art being in the eye of the beholder as opposed to and the point of offensiveness is in the eye of the beholder as well. Uh, Council, what, what I'm, I, I'm, just to, to move this forward as we're kind of going back and forth on this, you, um, one of Nick's last points I think made good sense. I mean, the, the whole crawl, walk, run kind of thing if we've not done this before. I wonder if we accept what uh, the Planning Commission approved earlier. We move forward with this knowing full well if in the first year we get five re uh, asks to do a 100% mural, that we, we look at this again and we, we reconsider it. Uh, I think it's, it's a good point that, yes, murals are expensive kind of things to do, expensive to maintain, um, and that the 50%, while it's a limit, it also it gives people it gives them the palette to work on and the understanding of what that palette can be. And if we have more, if, if we have people coming forward and saying, nope, we need, we need more, 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 I think we could reconsider this, but it might make sense to simply move forward with what the Planning Commission recommended to us um, after a good discussion, I think, and, and some good points that were brought forward. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm very happy to move the ordinance if everybody else is okay with that. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Okay. I move to adopt ordinance 2023. 89, I guess, I don't know, and supporting policy amendment, de amending the definition of a mural and establishing new standards and procedures for installing murals in Bloomington. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Carter to uh, adopt the ordinance and the supporting policy amending the definition of a mural and establishing new standards and procedures for installing murals in Bloomington. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries five to one with Councilmember Lohman in opposition. Uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro, we need a uh, summary publication. Oh, we do, okay. Thank you for moving the slide forward because I didn't have my paper in front of me. Uh, I move to adopt resolution uh, to authorize summary publication of the murals ordinance. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Carter for summary publication. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Well, thank you. Thanks to the staff for the work on this. Thanks for the discussion, Council. And, and, and I do think if, if this comes back to us in a year, or two years, however many it is, and people saying, nope, we, we, we want to paint the whole darn building, we can have that discussion then. I think that works. We will move on to item 4.2 on our agenda. This is uh, continuing the discussion for our West 98th Street and 35W study report. Mr. Kirk Roberts is here. I think we're going to... Uh, 
uh, discuss it a bit more, discuss whether or not the council would like to accept the report, and we do have a public comment opportunity on this as well. Mr. Roberts, good evening, welcome. Good evening, thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, this is an item that you've heard about and discussed before, so my introductory comments will be brief. Um, the, um, the corridor study extending from Janes Avenue over to Lindale Avenue was needed for a number of reasons. Um, the uh, foremost of which was to help develop a new plan for the interchange that preserves the transit use on the southeast corner of the interchange that's become such a, a part of this area. Um, we also wanted to be sure that the resulting design could maintain capacity into the future, including to accommodate the city's vision for the area, um, such as the Lindale retrofit and the associated traffic from that, uh, as well as some development options the city's looking at um, for transit-oriented development. Uh, the corridor also has significant uh, pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic is increasing as trails thread their way through the area. We'd like to see if we can make conditions better for non-motorized users. Um, and lastly, we wanted to address the safety issues uh, for everyone on the corridor. There's some known safety uh, issues there. And um, so council, as a result of the study, uh, this is what we've got. Uh, first, we have a plan that represents Bloomington's vision for the future. Um, that includes plans for a transportation system that works for all users and a plan that will guide and accommodate the changes that we'd like to see in the area in the future. Um, it's a plan that has opportunity. As mentioned, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority and Metro Transit are looking at some transit-oriented development options in the area. This plan looks at those, evaluates those, and helps accommodate those. Uh, including some housing options geared towards transit-dependent populations. Um, it also makes way for the city's vision for land use in the area, as I mentioned, the Lindale retrofit plan. Uh, renewal, we've identified 19 million in potential projects that we'd like to start building over the next 20 years. Hopefully we'll do sooner than that. The first of those will, will come likely in 2026. Um, and then the plan embraces partnerships. So as we've worked forward with the state and the county, um, our plans for the corridor have become their plans for the corridor. They're excited about what we're doing and they share our vision for the area. Uh, colleagues at Metro Transit have not only participated in the study, but they've become advocates for our vision for what we'd like to see in the future and how transit can accommodate that. I appreciate the council and the public's time to hear this issue, to discuss this issue tonight. Um, but I also just want to take a minute to call, um, call on the, my colleagues and brag on my colleagues at the Bloomington Housing and Redevelopment Authority and the Port Authority. Engineering has been the public face for this study and not a very lovely face when I'm self-respecting in, looking inward. Um, and their um, partnership and their heavy lifting on this has been uh, really key to making a good study that will guide the city's vision into the future. So to talk about the study, the process, and the outcome is Brian Nemeth with Bolton and Mink. Thank you, Kirk. Good evening, Mr. Nemeth, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, thank you, Council Members. Uh, moving forward um, on the study, just providing some um, Background on it, we did have a lot of engagement opportunities throughout the entire uh, study we had. We have um, we had some publicity with some sidewalk decals, video interview with Kirk on the website. We have social media flyers and email subscriptions out to um, community members. We have the website, Let's Talk Bloomington, um, uh, up on the, the city's website. We also had pop-up events, some focused conversations, um, some pre-open house engagement, and then actual open houses um, with the community. Getting into that a little bit, we do have two pop-up events that we had in fall of 2022, uh, one at the farmer's market and then one also at the transit station. Transit station was um, really important to get other community members that are using that transit station, people that are walking, biking, um, using the park and ride, also um, switching buses in that area. So just to get their opinions of the corridor and how they're using the corridor. We also had three focused conversations with the community, one at Creekside Community Center, uh, one at Kennedy High School and one at Summer House Independent Living, just to understand how different age groups and how different economic groups and um, people use this corridor um, from different areas. 
Um, we also had two open houses. Um, we had both an in-person open house and also some online engagement, for, which was up for about four weeks um, during that same time, um, con consistent with the open house that we had. Um, one in December and then an additional open house in May. Uh, just a little bit background here on the transportation use um, on the corridor. So currently you see on the left side is how people are using the corridor today. A uh, vast majority of people are driving along the corridor. There are some people that are using public transportation um, and um, some others that are walking on the corridor, some that are biking on the corridor. But the majority, biggest majority use is, is driving on the corridor. How people you want to use the corridor People are still going to drive. People that said that they were going to drive it today, they're still going to drive it into the future. But then we also see if the corridor were improved, if they could bike more, if they could walk more, if they could use transit more, that there would be more use for those types of uses along there. So this is an understanding that not only do we need to improve it for bicyclists and for pedestrians and for transit users along the corridor, we also do need to maintain it for vehicle movements throughout the care area. Uh, we did have a lot of comments. I'm not going to go through all the comments. I think most of it relates to just what I talked about on the previous slide, talking about how people feel um, uncomfortable right now walking and biking along this corridor. Um, there are some congestion areas for vehicles, uh, specifically at Old Chakby Road and at the interchange. Um, but generally, it's really the lack of pedestrian and bicyclist facilities and wide facilities that people can use and just different opportunities for those. Um, again, going out throughout the corridor, looking at lighting, um, wider facilities, more bike lane, bike type facilities that are available for everybody. Throughout the entire study, looking at um, three different stages of concept development. We do have stage one, which is kind of the short near term. Um, MnDOT has currently as a project in 2026 to replace the signal um, systems at the interchange. As part of that project, they're looking at doing some other um, geometric type of improvements there um, that they're, they're looking through in 2026. So looking at any of those short-term projects would be associated with those MnDOT projects. Um, the midterm is a 10 to 20 year time frame is really to accommodate some development and redevelopment growth largely within the um, kind of near the Lindale Avenue area. And then also it's growth and um, can we fit anything within the existing right of way? So not trying to take property to develop this midterm option. The other th thing with that is maintaining the existing bridge maintained over I-35W. Um, that is a MnDOT owned bridge um, crossing I-35W, even though it is a county facility crossing there, it is a MnDOT owned bridge. Uh, latest information on that is that the bridge replacement will be beyond 20 years. It has still about 20 years of life left in that bridge. Um, and so that we have a long-term vision would be um, replacing that bridge and also look at anything where we need a more additional right-of-way that cannot be fit in there. So jumping into the midterm corridor concepts, looking on the west end, um, this is on the old Chakby Road area. Um, some of the things that this concept does based on some of the comments we've had is it adds a crossing on, at Humboldt Avenue uh, currently, the only signalized crossings of 98th Street in this area is, is at DuPont Avenue on the east end and James Avenue on the west. Um, so this is adding another crossing at Humboldt Avenue, which is associated with where uh, Metro Transit currently has some bus stops around that area. Um, so they're looking at this as an improvement for um, some of that transit access. Um, we're also looking at improved railroad crossings for the pedestrians and bicyclists, um, changing the angle that bicyclists are able to cross the tracks at, um, so there's less chance of uh, bike tires going into those rail, um, into those rail lines. Um, also re reducing and eliminating side swipes. Um, so currently on Old Shockby Road, it goes down from two lanes down to one, makes a wide sweeping right turn um, that goes on to east, uh, West 98th Street eastbound. Um, so limiting some of those side swipes that you have with all the traffic merging and then trying to switch lanes um, as we move through there. Uh, the biggest change really here is a modifying the westbound left with the northbound right. Um, have a no turn on red, so we'd have actually two lanes that take um, Old Chocopee Road, take two lanes that turn right. Um, 
would be concurrent with that westbound left um, that currently is out there. So providing the same capacity with, with just with two lanes that now would stop versus one sweeping uh, lane that would go right. Um, also with that would be um, modifying the pedestrian crossings both across Old Shakopee Road um, and then you also have the Humboldt Avenue um, improvement there. And then a multi-use trail on the south side. So widening the existing facility up to about 10 feet for that multi-use trail. Uh, Midterm corridor concept for the existing bridge, so it's the I-35W area, um, DuPont Avenue, um, East Bloomington Freeway. Um, looking at there is really reducing the op revising the operations of the traffic signal to reduce some of those conflicts that are out there. We've had a lot of bicyclist and pedestrian crashes at DuPont Avenue and that interchange there. So making some improvements, working with Hennepin County um, to improve the, the traffic operations there with some different timings. Um, Potentially adding that red line on the north side there is um, a transit bypass lane. So currently Metro Transit does have a priority signal that can get through there, but this would actually provide a, a little more priority through there. Um, and this all will depend on, on Hennepin County's ability to add that into the project. Um, other big things to, to add some additional improvements, both for pedestrians and for vehicles, would be removing that southbound free right so requiring that southbound right coming off the freeway to, to stop at the actual signal and then make that turn movement, um, both improve safety for vehicles and also improve safety for the pedestrians crossing those areas. Um, on the east side, we would keep the transit station where it's currently relocated, um, currently located today. Um, those are Ralph properties um, that were, or again, as Kirk had mentioned previously, that they are properties that were um, bought for um, that future interchange concept that now is being used by the transit station. Um, that includes um, looking at redevelopment in that area or development in the area, um, including a 250 space parking ramp and 5,000 square feet of commercial and also 375 apartment units within that site. So looking at some the Lindale Avenue area, um, we did identify three areas for some development, redevelopment, um, maintaining um, area two, area one I already talked about was the Metro Transit Station area. We also have area two is kind of near that big parking lot in front of Festival Foods, looking at adding some, possibly some apartment um, apartments in that area. And then also northwest of the Lindale Avenue 98th Street intersection looking at adding some square footage for commercial retail, and then also a 300 um, unit apartment, um, and then just kind of maintaining some of that other development that's there, in con consistent with the Lindale retrofit plan. Uh, looking at Lindale Avenue um, on this midterm concept, so this is kind of the east end of the corridor. Um, big takeaways in this area is eliminating those free right movements, again, safer for pedestrians, um, shortening some of those crossings in that, in that um, area. Also, um, single left turn lanes, um, eastbound, westbound, what we found out with, with the traffic review out there is that the traffic is um, unequal between the two different left turn lanes and most of the traffic stacks up in one of them. So reducing that down to one left turn lane still provides the same capacity, but also um, shortens the pedestrian crossing um, across 98th Street and across Lindale Avenue. Um, also improved pedestrian ramps, improved access to that, the transit station um, with some of these wider uh, pedestrian facilities. Um, the other big thing would be the extension of the trail um, from West 98th Street on the east side of Lindale Avenue to the south. So currently to the south of here, there is a trail um, that starts a few blocks south of the, um, the commercial development in that area. So extending that trail to connect it all the way up to West 98th Street. And look at the long-term concepts. Um, so this would be ones that re would require, this um, on the west end is requiring some additional right-of-way. Um, so very limited right-of-way right between the existing um, edge of curb that we have on the north side and those property lines on the north side. So looking at a multi-use trail on that north side but that will require some extensive right-of-way to be obtained from those properties on that side. So that's more of a long-term um, option there. The other thing is the replacement of the bridge. So with that, we would want to add 
um, an additional eastbound left turn lane. So part of this is looking at with that um, interchange alternative that was developed in the 90s, making sure that we can provide enough capacity out here to be equivalent to what that interchange concept would have provided. By adding this additional eastbound left turn lane, we can provide that same capacity. But then also with the facilities that we're adding here is adding a 10 foot trail on the north side. So currently out there today, there is a 10 foot trail on the south side on the bridge, but it's only about six feet on the north side. So expanding that those facilities on both sides. Uh, some other minor improvements there. One other improvement to note here would be the westbound right turn lane um, right near Clover Shopping Center um, and actually providing a separate turn lane for that traffic to get over to northbound 35W. Um, that would be more, probably more development, redevelopment um, process that when that development of that property um, occurs, that's when that probably that right turn lane would be added. We do have that open house number two in May. Uh, we did have a comment period of four weeks. We had over 100 people visit the website during that time. We had 75 people um, either engaged with online comments or at in-person comments at the open house. Um, I guess I'll just jump back to that. Overall, general comments, was, this is the way. Um, it, it's a good option for the corridor. Um, provides some of those extra pedestrian and bicyclist facilities. Provides those enhancements to transit. Um, beyond the study, looking beyond north and south of 98th Street, we are look, also looking at pedestrian bridge options in this study um, that are located in there. We do have mentioned one here on at West 98th Street is taking advantage of some of the grades that we have out there and providing a new crossing potentially uh, north of the railroad bridge um, and then looking at different options to cross the railroad in that area. Another option we're looking at is at West, West 100th Street. This one gets a little more difficult with some of the grades that are in the area and the, the close development that we have around the area. So that there would probably be a little bit more um, there are longer ramps that would need to be built up in these areas, um, plus also some elevators and everything else to make this accessible to everybody. Uh, additionally, you're also looking at a West 98th Street crossing. Um, the boxes on north side and south side is not how large that, that building would ne necessarily need to be on either side, but just indicating that we would want this um, bridge or skyway um, to be located on the northeast corner of that transit property, um, connecting to that on Aldrich Avenue in the northwest corner. So with some kind of facility there. We're looking at a Skyway facility in this area just because of the space that it takes up to get um, ramps or anything else in this area. Um, so more of a Skyway option. And this would be adjacent to that green spine from the Lindale retrofit plan. And that would connect it to the, the transit station. Um, after council acceptance tonight, um, state staff from both the HRA, Port Authority, and Public Works would begin conversations and negotiations with Metro Transit and the Met Council for that, um, the um, Ralph properties um, where the existing transit station are located. Also working with Public Works programming for projects developed and added to the CIP. Um, as far as funding and partnering, um, looking at projects developed and added to the CIB, CIP, and as Mentioned previously, the first project is likely in 2026, um, especially with MnDOT. Um, also looking at outside funding, state and federal aid as program opportunities al align, and also looking at um, development, redevelopment when those um, proposals come in. In summary, the recommended concepts achieve the study goals, but provide a long-term plan for the interchange, uh, preserve and enhance the transit station that's out there, maintain existing vehicle mobility, including transit, um, enhance non-motorized traffic mobility throughout this corridor, improve safety for all users, including bus um, transit, um, vehicle owners, uh, bicyclists, and pedestrians along this area. Also allow for traffic growth due to redevelopment, uh, development and redevelopment of the area. So staff recommends that the council accept the West 98th Street at Interstate 35W traffic study report. And that'll be it. Thank you, Mr. Nemeth. Council, we've uh, seen most of this before, I think, and we had some good discussion on it. Any additional comments or questions? Councilmember Member Delmasandro. 
I guess the only question that I have is, um, so I like the concepts a lot, and I think you all have done a nice job of of recognizing that um, there's an opportunity for coexisting here that is really positive. Um, I'm curious if, if you have any ability to, uh, um, to help us understand um, like what the impacts are on a uh, on on the uh, on the flow of traffic. Um, so we would be expecting, at least hypothesizing, that we'd see um, those f- folks who want to take uh, bikes or um, want to, to walk or want to get to public transportation, that they would see a, an improvement in their accessibility and their safety, et cetera. How are we going to measure that is an open question for me. And then the second question is, knowing that, especially with that stop at at the corner, um, we know that that's probably going to have a negative impact on flow of traffic, but not necessarily in a bad way. We just need to know what that is and how would we measure that. So I'm, I'm curious if we have any thoughts on what we're hypothesizing the impacts there to be and, and how we would plan to come back and talk about whether we were right or not on those fronts. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, yes, we did do as our part of our evaluation of the uh, corridor, what we were looking at is reducing the number of um, conflict points that we have during different modes. Um, that is overall providing a safety improvement by having less conflicts, providing less time that, so anytime we can shorten a pedestrian crossing up, we're providing less time that those two um, pedestrians and vehicles would be in conflict with each other. So that's another improvement we were looking at. Um, so while, we, and we did measure out, we did a, do a traffic analysis of de- measuring the delay um, that would be under each one of the different improvements compared to the, the no build condition. Um, so. We, while the you know the like old Shakopee Road to eastbound um, 98th Street would appear since we're making now traffic stop, it's only tra- stopped for less than half the time. So overall, we're providing the same level of service, actually a little bit better than the existing condition that's out there. Even though right now everybody feels that they can just always go through, the reality is if we make a few people stop, we'll have less people and less congestion um, overall. Yeah, that's a really interesting hypothesis. Are, do we have, as part of these concepts, is there a, is there a um, a plan to actually like pilot stopping that traffic at some point and and seeing if that holds up? Um, responding to that, there is no plan currently. Um, I will say the models that we're using right now have been vetted through um, multiple. Um, the Transportation Research Board and the Institute of Transportation Engineers to be accurate for what conditions we'd be looking at. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Thanks. Councilmember Lohman. So then just uh, <clears throat> really just one question, and it's just uh, for that for those folks that are on 98th Street, uh, just as you take the, I call it the power curve, or I've heard of that before, uh, what uh, would folks end up losing some of their, their, their property there if that trail is placed in there, or is that going to be done within the existing uh, uh, right-of-way? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. There are two properties currently that where the trail shows um, going over that property. Um, the belief is right now is that one of them for sure has a has a utility easement, in which case the um, for trail or, or sidewalk in that area so that one property won't. Well, there's another property that we're still trying to determine whether there is an easement or if some property, but there's only one um, that's a possibility. Okay, yeah, because it just looked like a lot was being done with that. And I'm like, it's amazing that there's <laughs> no right of way being asked or, you know, yes. additional <laughs> taking there. So, okay. Right. Yep, and I will, I'll, I'll note on that we are um, narrowing the lanes on eastbound and westbound, so we're able to oh. push the curb further north to be able to gain some space there. Also, the um, lane closest to the south side of the highway mm-hmm. is actually starting, we're not starting that until further east away from Old Shakopee Road. So there's there's an advantage we're actually gaining another lane um, of space there too for Boulevard space. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. I'll hold my one comment until later. Thank you. Council, additional questions? All right, uh, don't go far. But uh, what I would like to do now is uh, we have in the agenda the opportunity for public comment on this project. I'd like to open up that public comment opportunity right now and see if there's anyone in the chambers who would like to speak on item 4.2, our West 98th Street and 35W study report. Anybody in the chambers wishing to speak on this? 
Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, no one on the phone. Last call for anybody in the chamber is very good. Uh, hello, my name is Brian Savig. I'll sign in as I speak. Um, just a couple of questions. What's the age of the existing bridge on 98th Street? Uh, what, when it, what is it, the age? Yes, I, the I heard your question. If you just ask your question, we'll answer the questions after. Oh, okay, after all right. Done. And so. secondly, do we have counts of pedestrian, bicycle, and uh, rolling traffic through that intersection? Um, okay. Those would be the two questions that I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak at our public comment period here? If not, uh, Council, I will close the public comment period at this time. And I'm confident we have the answers to your questions. Uh, the age of the current bridge and the, the, uh, the counts for non-motorized. So the pedestrians, the bicyclists, the rollerbladers, the skateboarders, the scooters, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um I don't have it offhand what the age of the bridge is, um, but did, MnDOT did a, do a recent assessment, and their assessment was that it had 20 years um, of life, in the existing bridge, before it would have to be rehabilitated. Um, but we can make sure to add that to the report. Um, the other thing is we do have uh, pedestrian and bicyclist counts at all of the intersections, um, at least all the signalized intersections on the corridor, um, providing um, those pedestrians, the number of pedestrians and bicyclists, but I do not know all those offhand. And Council, I'll just add to that. The last time that we actually counted pedestrians over the 98th Street Bridge, it was about 300 uh, or more pedestrians and bicyclists across that bridge a day. That's one of the higher locations in the city in terms of pedestrian and bicyclists. For reference, the Normandale Lake District, we have all the recreational use around the lake. That's about 900 uh, pedestrians a day on that one. So uh, this is one of two very high pedestrian areas of the city, the other being the area up around uh, American Boulevard in Chicago, that area where we have um, pedestrians in the hundreds as well. Thank you. Well, Council, uh, our action tonight is basically to accept this uh, report if we if we deem it to be uh, acceptable. Uh, what I like about it, uh, hearing a lot of things, first of all, the the understanding, and I think Councilmember D'Alessandro kind of mentioned uh, this, touched on this, that the need to maintain the traffic mobility, but at the same time to balance the needs of the bicyclists, the pedestrians, and so on, that we've got to find a happier medium because right now we don't have a happy medium. And so to, I, I'm glad to see some of the suggested changes would push us in that direction, and that would, that would be, I think, very valuable. Uh, the, the development and redevelopment options, we've, all, we've been talking about that for a long while in that area. And I think, the, I think in a lot of ways they go hand in hand. To make that a bit of a softer landscape, I think would encourage redevelopment, especially housing and other possible redevelopment opportunities. And so I'm, I'm excited about that. And the thing I think that I'm most excited about, uh, Mr. Roberts, was your comments about the partnerships that uh, we've developed on this and how now this, this Bloomington plan has become the plan of others, that they're looking at this and they understand the need for this and the importance of this and the quality of the work that has been done on this and that we can, they can take pieces of it and move forward. And I uh, appreciate Bloomington's leadership on that, but I also appreciate that um, appreciate and understand that we, we can't do this alone and it needs to be that uh, partnership with our friends at MnDOT and at the county and at the Met Council and everywhere else if we're going to accomplish this and so uh, appreciate the good work that went into building those relationships and cultivating the, uh, the, the connections that needed to happen in order to make this uh, a success. So uh, I, I think this is, uh, this is good work. I think it, I thought it was good work the first time we saw it and I think it's, it's good work now. So. Council, any additional comments? Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think you were quite eloquent. The only thing I would, a uh, couple of things I would add to this is that when I'm coming home from a Twins game um, and I take that free uh, right after the Twins have lost, um, I'm going to be disappointed that I'm going to be 10 seconds later to my house uh, if that's gone. Uh, but I recognize that... Uh, for those uh, other fans that are, are struggling and biking home um, after the game, that might be a better uh, experience for them, so I'll, I'll accept that. But in all seriousness, uh, uh, I, I do hope that uh, we look through that corridor and make sure that we're looking at the sustainability of, of that entire corridor and making sure uh, that, uh, that we're keeping up with what needs to happen in our plannings, any of the things that are there that need to be done. 
And then as we're doing that, we're also being careful um, uh, for those folks uh, end up losing land. Uh, that is a significant uh, situation uh, for them. You know, we've had that happen uh, just recently uh, to make a corridor safer. And uh, I, I know it was necessary, but we're just if there's any way to avoid that, even for one resident, I'd like to make sure we do that. Thank you, Council Member Loman. Other comments, Council? If not, Council, I would look for action. I'd look for uh, the motion that we have. Uh, I guess it's not in front of us, but uh, uh, we, I'd look for a motion that the Council accept the West 98th Street at Interstate 35W traffic study report. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Mua to accept the West 98th Street at Interstate 35W traffic study report. Any further council discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to the next steps here now and seeing how this kind of plays out in terms of what the short term, the medium, the moderate term, and then the long term vision starts to sh take shape. So thank you. Well done. That concludes item four on our agenda, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, and it will move us into our organizational business. And we've got two uh, update and discussion items that we're gonna talk about. No, uh, no specific decisions, more direction on this one in particular, and then just information on the next one. Item 5.1 is an update and discussion on the cannabis legislative realities, now embracing the state of Minnesota. And I think we've got Peter Zuniga from our legal staff and Christina Scipioni from our city clerk's office to lead us through this. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's nice to see you tonight. Uh, we are here for um, what will probably be the first of many different discussions that we have um, in response to the cannabis legislation um, that was passed earlier this year at a state level. Um, tonight, specifically, we will be um, providing you with a, an overview, a legislative summary of the portions of the law that most directly affect um, the city of Bloomington, our operations, and our policy decisions moving forward. We'll also talk about a timeline for uh, the regulation process and those policy decisions. They said we'll be back before you a couple of different times um, as we're reacting to this new legislation. So kind of laying out what that looks like at a high level. Um, and then there are some items this evening um, that we are seeking council um, discussion and direction. Um, and those policy items are um, cannabis use in public places, um, lower potency hemp edible sales um, by liquor stores, and um, cannabis a cannabis license moratorium. And then, of course, there's always time for city council questions and directions on any other topics or items that we didn't cover that you'd like to make sure we bring back to you with additional information. Um, so to start us off, um, we're part of the, a huge part of what this legislation did was create an Office of Cannabis Management. Um, so this is the new state agency that is responsible for regulating cannabis within the state of Minnesota. Um, and it is guided by a Cannabis Advisory Council that has um, 50 appointed or designated individuals. Um, and that does include a representative from the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, so cities' viewpoints are represented on that council. Um, but when you hear me we speak today when you hear me talk about the OCM that is that state agency um, that as cannabis regulation moves forward we will be working closely with um, in our in our regulation and management of cannabis here in Bloomington the legislation did allow for some local control of um, cannabis sales. Um, cities are allowed to adopt reasonable restrictions on the time, place, and manner of the operations of a cannabis business. Um, cities, though, cannot prohibit the possession, transport transportation, or use of cannabis within its borders. Um, and cities also have the ability to limit the number of licensed retailers to no fewer than one registration for every 12,500 residents. Thank you. Um, the new legislation allows uh, made possession of cannabis legal effective August 1st of this year. Um, so we're 28 days into um, the legalization of possession of cannabis. Um, there are some restrictions on the amount of product that a person can, can possess. And then there are restrictions on where you can 
possess the cannabis. So things like public schools and school buses, or charter schools, state correctional facilities, federal process, federal property if you're under 21, um, or in a vehicle if the package is open and not in the trunk and away from um, where the driver is and the passenger is. Similar um, cannabis use um, became legal effective August 1st of 2023. And again, there are regulations on where cannabis use is not allowed. Um, so cannabis use is covered by the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act. And so it is regulated similar to tobacco where you can't smoke that product in areas where um, tobacco smoking is not currently allowed by that act. Um, you cannot smoked, use tobacco, <laughs> excuse me, cannabis when you're operating mo mo motor vehicle. Um, in school buses, charter schools, public schools, correctional facilities, um, in a location where the smoke or vapor may be inhaled by a minor uh, on federal property or if you're under 21 years old. Um, the cities, in addition, have authority to prohibit use in a public place. And so that's one of the policy items that we'll be walking you through um, in just a little bit. Mr. Mayor, if I can pause for just a moment. Mr. Brugge, would you go back there? The... Um, the bullet under the prohibited use, the where smoke or vapor may be inhaled by a minor, uh, there is not good clarification in the statutory language about what that means, correct? Mayor and uh, City Manager Verbrugge, that is correct. That is the, the wording in the legislation, but it doesn't give us any further direction. So questions about uh, if you're at a store where people go in and out. If there's a child going in and out, uh, are you not allowed to then? If, uh, uh, if a child might be there, those are the kinds of things that we still need to work through um, some of the clarity questions since there isn't a lot of uh, clarity in the language itself. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify that point, does that include someone's personal private residence if they have children in there? <laughs> Didn't even make it through the presentation. <laughs> Mayor Council Member Nelson, uh, again, that is probably vague if a child is there. Uh, what the statute does allow is, or actually what the statute prohibits the city from regulating is the use of cannabis in a private residence. Uh, so there's there's no language within the statute that says if a child is present within that household that you can't use cannabis. So again, that's another vague area of the statute as well. Okay, onward. Uh, growing cannabis is also now legal under the new statute. Um, and uh, residents are allowed up to eight plants. Four of those can be mature plants. Um, it does, does require that those plants be enclosed in a locked space and not open for public view. So it's not as though I can plant it in my vegetable garden in my backyard without any sort of additional um, protection or fencing or um, screening from public view. Another piece of this um, legislation addressed lower potency hemp edible products, um, which we were um, kind of referring to in our code before as the THC edibles. So that's something that we had discussed. Um, that's not just me, right? <laughs> Um, so that is something that our current code addresses, um, but that this new legislation makes changes to uh, the regulations for those what are now termed lower potency hemp edibles. Um, and so those products are still legal. Um, regulation of those is being moved to the Department of Health, but they will eventually be licensed by uh, OCM. So the Department of Health is kind of an interim stop before OCM gets up and running and starts issuing those licenses. Uh, so the way it works is existing retailers need to register with the state by October 1st, 2023. Um, and there are additional standards now for those retailers regarding testing, labeling, serving sizes, sales. Um, actually, a lot of the sales provisions kind of mirror what cities had done to ensure that um, they were not accessible to minors. Um, so a lot of that is consistent with what we currently have in our code and what we discussed last year. Um, 
a big change is that sales are now allowed at exclusive liquor stores. Um, so under the previous legislation, exclusive liquor stores were not allowed to sell these products. It wasn't on the list of items that they could sell. That has been updated, so exclusive liquor stores can now um, sell these lower potency hemp edible products. Cities can continue licensing these products until the Office of Cannabis Management begins licensing them. So we are planning to continue on with our licensing program so we know where they are, we can make sure they know they need to register with the state, they're still being backgrounded, and then at the point where um, the state takes over that licensing, the city can no longer license those. So related to that point in kind of that this question and a bigger question. So when will OCM begin licensing and where is OCM in terms of just being up and running? I have a slide for that. Oh, good. It's okay. coming up, Mary. Thank you very much. So the licensing piece um, is quite complex, right? It's a 320-page bill. Yes. <laughs> um, so there's 16 different license types that OCM will begin administering. Um, and it goes everywhere from the seed, right, all the way to the smoke, kind of. It's a, it's a full-scale licensing program um, where they've got the cultivators, the manufacturers, the transporters, testers, wholesalers, retailers, right? Um, and so cities have a role in licensing the retail sale portion. Of, um, of all those different licensing types. And so for those retail sale portions, what happens is the cannabis business is going to apply with OCM. OCM consults the city to see if the business meets our, our zoning code requirements, if we have any sort of um, uh, limitation on the number, um, and just make sure that it meets our city code for building and zoning and, and, and licensing. Um, they review the application, the state conducts the background investigation, they issue the license, OCM does. Then the cannabis business is um, required to register with the city. So the city then provides a registration to that cannabis business. The city conducts the compliance checks and has the ability to set, suspend registrations for um, violations of um, state statute or city code. Cities also can collect registration fees and then receive cannabis tax revenue. So here we go, Mayor. Here is the timeline for the Office of Cannabis Management. So um, in September, so coming up next month, um, we anticipate that a director appointment will be made. Um, and then in fall 2023, the rulemaking process will start. And so a lot of the pieces of this bill, we're kind of waiting to see what then the rulemaking looks like and what the details of how those laws are going to be enacted. Um, and so we'll start kind of getting a peek at that this fall. Excuse me. Um, 2024, the Office of Cannabis Management continue, plans to continue rulemaking, um, hiring, ramping up their staff, um, creating a licensing system, preparing that, testing that. Uh, and the Office of Cannabis Management has shared they plan to or pre are prepared to be ready in early 2025 for accepting license applications and then um, issuing those licenses. So we have some time before. Um, we're going to see licenses issued in the state, most likely, given the, the timing that the Office of Cannabis Management is sharing with cities and, and the public at this point in time. So that brings us to the policy direction for the city here in Bloomington. So we have some consideration for the city council this evening, and we'll dive into these a little bit more, but again, that's smoking in parks and public places, um, lower potency hemp edible sales in liquor stores, um, and a cannabis sales moratorium. In early 2024, we expect to come back to the city council um, with zoning regulations, things like retailers, manufacturers, growers, um, licensing and registration regulations, things like fees, limits on the number of licenses we want to issue. Um, and so behind the scenes, what staff are doing, we're having these multi-departmental meetings where we're sharing information. Um, because this is such a, a large piece of legislation, we wanna make sure we as staff really have a good handle on, on all the different pieces so that we can come to council in early 2024 um, with different, different chunks of it, if you will, um, for your consideration and policy decisions on some of those much larger issues and some of those issues where we're waiting for rulemaking to happen so we have an idea of kind of where the state is headed. 
There are also internal processes that we are working on, things like tracking our expenses related to um, cannabis regulation, uh, making sure we have interdepartmental co coordination for things like violations, um, complaints, concerns, um, and then um, expungements is part of this legislation that our legal team has been working quite a bit on with the police department as far as how we handle those expungement requirements. So the first item we have for city council to discuss this evening is this cannabis use in public places. So under this legislation, cannabis cannot be prohibited in a private residence, including a yard, private property not generally accessible by the public unless the owner of that property prohibits it, um, and then events a li license to permit on-site consumption. The Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act does apply to smoking cannabis, um, and cities have the authority to prohibit the use in public places such as city property, parks, trails, and rights of way. So we took a look, right, when we were talking about smoking cannabis, our first thought is let's take a look at how we regulate smoking tobacco within the city. And so currently city code prohibits smoking tobacco in outdoor areas of bars and restaurants, except that half of the outdoor air, up to half of the outdoor area can ha be a designated smoking section. Um, and then it prohibits it within 25 feet of public places and places of work. In addition, it prohibits tobacco product use on any city beach areas, pools, athletic fields, including the spectator areas, golf courses, parks, conservation areas, shelters, walking and biking trails, um, and then any cultural events that are um, on city property. So the policy decision tonight is, does the city want to enact any um, any prohibitions on cannabis use or smoking in public places. Um, we have a few options, right? We can follow the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act and enact no additional prohibitions within the city of Bloomington. We can act prohibitions consistent with tobacco use um, and tobacco smoking within, city, within the areas that we just outlined. Uh, we could also create a separate definition of a public space specific to cannabis smoking or use. So if we wanted to add things like um, city streets, sidewalks, um, any other, <laughs> um, anything that isn't on the previous list, um, we, can, we can do that as well and define public place a little bit more broadly than it's currently defined for tobacco. Okay. The next policy question in front of city council this evening um, is regarding those lower potency hemp edible sales in liquor stores. Um, so as I mentioned, when we looked at this issue last year, um, the we, liquor stores were not allowed to sell these products. It wasn't on the list of approved products. Um, now with this new legislation, liquor stores could sell these lower potency hemp edibles products, um, but it requires an update to our city code because our city code does not include that allowance within it. Um, there is a setback issue, kind of an inconsistency, I should say, um, between our TH lower potency hemp edible sales, I was gonna say THC edibles, that's incorrect, um, and our liquor store setbacks. Our liquor store setbacks are 300 feet and the lower potency hemp edible sales is a 500 foot setback. So there is the potential that some of our liquor stores would not be eligible to sell because they don't meet the 500 foot setback even though they meet the 300 foot setback. Um, so I wanted to share that with council, make sure you're aware of that. So the policy decision here is um, whether or not the city council would like to allow liquor stores to sell the lower potency hemp edible products. And we have a few options. We can leave our code alone and not allow exclusive liquor stores to sell those products. Um, we can allow the sales by liquor stores and keep the 500 foot setback from schools. Um, that, and that means that some of our liquor stores may not be eligible to sell those products. Um, we could modify the setback for the lower potency hemp edibles so that it is consistent with our existing liquor store setback of 300 feet, um, or we could remove that setback if we so choose, um, and then the liquor stores would still be bound by the 300 foot setback to be a liquor store, um, but it would remove that um, 500 foot requirement from our city code for just the THC. Um, excuse me, lower potency hemp edible products. <laughs> 
And then the last item on the list today is the cannabis sales moratorium. So the new legislation allows city to adopt moratorium on cannabis businesses until 2025. That moratorium would not apply to the lower potency hemp edible licenses that we already have existing in the city. Um, the state expects that they're going to be ready to start receiving applications in January of 2025. They could do so earlier under the current legislation. Um, we as staff expect to have our cannabis regulations in place by June of 2024. So there is a potential risk that the state would begin licensing before the city regulations are in place. Is it very likely? I'm not sure about that. Um, but there is a risk that if the state gets up and running faster than it thinks it does, faster than we've kind of heard it will, um, that we might not be ready with our regulations by the time that we're asked to start reviewing applications and take regis taking registrations here at the city. Um, and so if we were to enact a moratorium, it would um, allow us through the end of 2024 to ensure that our, license, our licensing process, our zoning regulations, that everything is in place here before the state could start asking us to review applications and registering cannabis um, businesses. So our choices um, for this policy decision, we could enact a moratorium now. That moratorium can always be removed earlier. Let's say we're ready to go next April. We could choose to repeal that moratorium and just wait for the state to be ready. Um, we could defer a decision until next spring or next summer. You know, if it starts looking like the state's getting ready before we're ready, we could enact a moratorium at that time to give us the time we need um, to make sure all of our processes, procedures, and ordinances are in place. Or we can just choose not to enact, enact a moratorium. So with that, I know we went over a lot of information. Um, as a reminder, these are kind of our three policy items that we'd like you to discuss and provide some direction on this evening. Um, and then we are here for any questions that you may have as well. Thank you very much. Council, let's start with questions and then let's double back to the, uh, the different policy questions one at a time and take those one at a time. So just general questions that folks might have. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So in the exclusive liquor stores, minors are still allowed in those stores, correct? Because like I think about Total Wine or United Liquor. What, I mean, you, people can bring their children into those stores. They just obviously cannot purchase alcohol, and it's... Mayor and Councilmember Carter, that is correct. Minors accompanied by an adult could walk into those stores. Okay. Um, but if a 16-year-old were going to walk into Total Wine, they're not allowed to do that. Okay, so um, if we were to allow the lower potency edibles in, to be sold in those stores, could we regulate where they're located in those stores? So I think about tobacco products. I think that there are regulations about being behind counters, things like that. Are we allowed to... Mayor and Council Member Carter, so those those regulations currently exist in our code, okay. um, and they exist in the new statutes that were passed. Okay, so, thank you for that reminder. Yes. Okay, that was my clarifying question. Council Member Lowen. So my question, since I, I see that Nick is back there, <coughs> so I will ask uh, my question re with regard to um, when we look at that Clean Air um, Act in you know, kind of the history in terms of how that, uh, you know, came to be. Uh, when we look at cigarette smoke and that impact uh, that it has the general public, and we have the research to, to back that up. My question is, when we look at, um, uh, you know, uh, you know this this type of smoking, what type of impact, uh, you know, you know, does you know smoking, you know, <clears throat> this this type of product have that's different from cigarettes? Is it the same? You know, is it more impactful? Is it less impactful? I, I'm just curious. What are the what are the health implications for the the general public uh, when you look at uh, what we're trying to do around that Minnesota Clean Air Act? As we're you know trying to you're just trying to understand that. Uh, Mayor uh, Councilmember Lowen, uh, it is a <clears throat> very complex question. Uh, cigarettes or commercial tobacco products are fairly regulated. And so there is a fairly well-established scientific basis of what is going into the thing that is being combusted and the byproducts. Uh, currently, there is very little research 
out there on what uh, may be in a cannabis product that could be combusted and inhaled. Uh, some of that research looking at uh, using things like bongs uh, generates substantially more uh, PM 2.5, really small particulate matters. Um, it's about two and a half times more than a cigarette. Um, just given some of the complexities of the combustion and the variability. Uh, so we see a, a range. Uh, there are a little over 60 uh, byproducts of the cannabis combustion that are known to cause cancer. Um, so we see some of the same things, uh, but I can't provide you a list of the 300 some odd chemicals we might see in a, a commercial tobacco product uh, for this. But the, the byproducts of the combustion, we would have similar concerns for. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And then, uh, since you're already here, um, you know, as we're looking at uh, the the, uh, the the hemp piece, uh, and where in terms of a policy perspective, in terms of I know we just got done uh, working on uh, trying to get rid of uh, you know flavored tobacco. Um, you know, should I look at that hemp in terms of the same type of of you know, in terms of health risks to, to young folks, you know, what are the health risks is what I'm asking, you know, around that? And should I be concerned about as I look at this from a policy perspective? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Lohman, the, the primary health concern that we've been seeing, especially in youth, is is related to more of the, the overdose or overuse or, or multiple product. Um, so when you look at uh, pediatric or, or young adult issues, most of it deals with um, the over usage of a product or multiple components uh, happening um, that does carry the, the hemp product. We're not, uh, we don't have as much data as we have on some of the other cannabis products from a, uh, uh, what it does for uh, potential addiction pathways or other things like that. So what we've seen mostly is is concern about over usage. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. Did, did you ask for general questions first and then specific questions? Uh, yes, general questions, and then we can get into the specific questions about the policy questions as we as we go right. Back. Okay. Um, so you can tell me to table this one if it qualifies uh, as the latter. But I, I had a specific question about. Um, policing or enforcement, um, meaning, and it, it probably isn't related to any one of these things, sure. but I, I maybe for the sense. public. That's more of a general, I think. Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you. Uh, so I, I've been, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to whether or not our our police uh, leadership has weighed in on on what, what they would recommend in these circumstances. Um, I had a chance to talk to a couple of folks um, um, in my ride along the last Friday and and it was just an interesting conversation about the the black and white nature of for example and again this is might be getting into the specifics here for example if we just say it's not prohibited in public places that makes their life really really easy right if we say that it that we give it a little bit more leeway we make it a little harder for the enforcement aspect the other question that that I have is around you know what we're doing right now to enforce the ability for or the inability for minors to get at the um, I'm going to call it LPHE because that's an acronym that I like um, <laughs> uh, because I don't want to keep making you say that <laughs> um, and so um, you know what I understand that there you know we we may already have some challenges in enforcement there and it and so to me I, I'm just kind of curious you know where is where is the police department in weighing in on what their recommendations to us are. Um, if you have any. Mayor and Council Member De Alessandro, um, the police department has been involved in our conversations to date about some of these policy discussions and and um, and can, how it impacts their operations. And I would say that the message we've received from police is that consistency is helpful. You know, if we're treating smoking tobacco similar to smoking cannabis, that makes it easier for the police department to to enforce those regulations. Um, you see someone smoking in a city park, it's easy enough to say that's not allowed, right? Versus trying to figure out are they using tobacco or are they using um, uh, cannabis? Um, so the consistency piece of it is helpful. It's also, um, you know, the 
the more that we prohibit it in different places um, outside of smoking tobacco, then I think you're you're correct, um, the more difficult that makes it to enforce. And, um, you know, if you see someone smoking across the street, you've got to get close to see what is it that they're smoking potentially and investigate that. Um, and it could lead to, um, you know, just uneven enforcement and issues with enforcement um, when it's inconsistent with our tobacco smoking regulations. Councilmember Moore. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can you explain what the difference is between our tobacco and alcohol use ordinances, um, if there is a huge difference between the two? Um, Mayor, Council Member Mua, we do have differences in our tobacco and alcohol ordinances. For example, we do allow alcohol use within the parks under certain circumstances and within certain areas, um, whereas we don't allow that use um, with tobacco, tobacco products, or smoking. Um, there are some statutes that generally um, dictate where you are allowed to consume alcohol and not consume alcohol, uh, but there are some there are some differences between alcohol consumption and where you can do that um, within city property versus tobacco. Um, we kind of carve out some additional areas for alcohol under certain circumstances. And I think uh, I'm thinking more of like um, walking down the street drinking a beer versus walking down the street smoking a cigarette. Is there a big difference between those two? Yes, <laughs> council member Moore, there is a difference. Council other general questions, council member Nelson. Yeah, um, two quick general questions. One, so if I understand it correctly, you can legally possess marijuana, but with maybe one or two exceptions, you can't legally buy it anywhere. Is that accurate? Uh, Mayor and council member Nelson, that is correct. <laughs> Makes total sense to me. Um, <laughs> not at all confusing. Um, and then my second question is, so we talked about, you know, smoking marijuana, but it comes in all sorts of different forms. What about those things? And, and you know, edibles, um, I think there's oils, I don't know all this stuff, but uh, how, are, how are you proposing or thinking that we should be handling those in terms of these, also in terms of these policy questions, so... Mayor and Council Member Nelson, staff has had some discussions about um, other than um, use other than smoking, um, and from just a practical standpoint, trying to figure out is someone eating gummy worms at a playground or a different substance at a playground might be difficult, right? To kind of manage that and how we how we actually would enforce something other than smoking. Um, there's also kind of the the policy decision is is that an impact within that park if someone is um, having some THC, some CPHEs, or um, L lower potency um, products, thank you, LPHE, I can't read my own handwriting, um, products within a park versus smoking, creating you know, secondhand smoke for others who are enjoying that park. Um, so we've had that discussion both on an enforcement side of how do we, how would we logistically enforce um, just prohibitions on use entirely um, versus the smoking piece of, I think, is a little bit more cut and dry within our parks um, and within other um, public places. If I might, um, just one quick other question. Um, what about the, um, the drinks, the THC drinks? Are those allowed in parks? If you can have a beer, can you have a THC drink, a low-potency <laughs> Mayor, <laughs> Mayor and Council Member Nelson, I mean, currently, yes, you could. Um, that is, a again, a policy decision for the city council is if the council wishes to prohibit use of those lower potency and cannabis products within parks altogether or if they would prefer to focus on the smoking piece of it um, and the use. All right, Council, maybe let's, it's time to, and let's double back and get back to the specific questions that uh, were before us. Um, can you back the slides up so we can go, let's start with the, let's do them in order. I think we started with cannabis in public places. And I think the, uh, the options, the possibilities were to follow the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act, so no additional prohibitions. 
to enact prohibitions consistent with our tobacco prohibitions or to create a separate definition of public place specific to cannabis smoking or use. Uh, for a, a couple of things that people have already brought up, I think it's, it might make most sense to enact our prohibitions consistent with the tobacco prohibitions that we have in place. Uh, I, I do think it would be easier for in enforcement. I think it's easier to explain to people and an understanding with folks. And uh, I think it also, one thing that we really need to make sure that we are careful about is uh, this notion of uneven enforcement, to make sure that if we get into additional separate definitions of public place and they're, they're misunderstood or they're not understood as well, or if there's, if there's, just, if, if there's enforcement questions at all, I think we, we leave ourselves open to problems. So I, I do personally think that the, uh, the prohibitions that we have in place with our tobacco prohibitions um, might be the way to go. Frankly, I thought that's what we had originally. I thought, I, I thought our ordinance was written as uh, smoking in general, but I think it's specific tobacco use, and since cannabis isn't considered tobacco, it doesn't necessarily apply. But I do think this is probably the path of least resistance, and it gets to a lot of the concerns that we have. Uh, and I think, uh, Councilmember Lohman, to your point, this, uh, the, 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 the notion of secondhand smoke as opposed to somebody eating a, a gummy, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's a mind-altering chemical, but then again, so is the beer that they're drinking. And so, uh, but at least then they're, they're not impacting others around them through the smoking. Mm -hmm. Just my thoughts on that one. Uh, Councilmember Member D'Alessandro? Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's right. I, the counterpoint I'll make is not mine. It came from a conversation I had with um, a police officer who said, um, so if you are, to Councilmember Mua's point, walking down the sidewalk and you're smoking a cigarette, that's completely allowed, even though that's technically a public space, right? Um, but you can't walk down with an open beer mm -hmm. because it's an intoxicating substance. And we've regulated intoxicating substances in, in certain public places differently than tobacco. And so to me, this a lot of this hinges on whether or not we, we decide as a group we're going to treat cannabis as an intoxicating substance or we're going to take it as something you smoke because if we're consistent about it being an intoxicating substance then we could apply those regulations uniformly so then you know in enforcement we have a very straight you know line if you will um same if we do tobacco the the question becomes you know how do you how do you you know how do you impact the ability the you know, public intoxication gets hard when you're talking about smoking something if you don't have a regulation that sides with smoking a certain thing is public intoxication. And so I, I, don't, I don't know what to, to offer there in terms of, of a specific, um, um, well, maybe I do. I, I'm saying I, I think that leaning towards in our public spaces what we, what we regulate for the purposes of, of – intoxicating substances might be a better like uniform answer but i i don't know if that's true because you know i'm not obviously a police officer and i'm not a legal professional so i don't know if if we feel like that would give us the coverage we feel like we need to be consistent Councilmember Moore Thank you mayor and i, I completely agree with that point that was my biggest hang up is uh, marijuana THC is an intoxicating substance it is not the exact same as tobacco and so my train of thought has trended more to the alcohol portion of it, right? So we, we, you can't walk down the street drinking a beer. You can't walk down the street drinking a THC product. Um, so I, I would lean more towards the intoxication portion of it, of how we regulate, versus just treating it as it is tobacco. Um, although, um, you know, the, it, it overlaps, Right, it, it's not just as simple as <clears throat> treated as tobacco, treated as alcohol. That there is an overlap, and so um, having more of the intoxication part of it would be uh, something I'd be more comfortable with. Councilmember Carter, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I think um, so. I agree in principle, but for me, it goes back to the enforcement piece. And I just, I mean, to your to the point you made in your comment before around your conversation with police officers and uneven enforcement and just issues there and uh, the conversations that city staff have had. Um, it just makes me very concerned that it would get, we would get it to a point where it's so overcomplicated that it would be impossible to enforce. Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, as a commentary. Uh, uh, 
Council Member Carter, you are you done with your point? Uh, um, so I will just add that um, I'm leaning toward uh, enacting the prohibitions consistent with the tobacco pro prohibitions. Um, again, in principle, totally agree, but I just don't um, know how you how the enforcement piece could work um, in a way that is consistent and equitable. Um, and I think that the primary concern that I have would be the impacts on other people and primarily, you know, kids and families who are trying to enjoy the parks or the beaches or our trails. And, um, and it's that secondhand um, smoke exposure that is the biggest concern for me. Again, I have broader concerns, right, that I'm sure that there were lots of conversations that were had at the state level this last legislative session related to intoxicating substances and people using them um, when they legalized THC products. Um, but for our purposes here, I think uh, that's the direction that I'm leaning. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I realized I should have checked myself, Mr. Mayor, because you know there's another, I can, I can make, we can go back and forth on this argument all day. Uh, caffeine and, and tobacco are also intoxicating substance. We just approve of them because they're uppers, not downers. I mean, let's be honest, right? So, you know, there's plenty of health concerns associated with caf over overuse of caffeine, overuse of, of tobacco, et cetera. And so, you know, again, it's a question of enforcement, but it's also a question of public health. I think one of the scenarios that isn't covered in either case, for example, would be if I'm on the, if I'm on the corner let's say I have an apartment and I have a group of people out there and they're completely within their right to, to congregate and I walk by uh, and I'm like, hey, can I have a hit off of that? Like, what do we do? Like, if that person's 16 years old and, you know, or whatever, like, that becomes unenforceable in a lot of ways because we don't have potentially, like, the ability to provide something that the that people can work with. And so I don't, I don't, Maybe we don't solve for that either way, but it, you know, is just one of those kind of middle ground areas. Certainly, if a if a police officer was driving by and saw a public, not a public, but even in a private space like a community gathering, and a, a minor was holding an open beer can, they'd be able to do something about it. And in this case, they may not be able to do something about it. So that's just the thought I have as a counterpoint, negating everything I just said earlier. <laughs> so that's awesome. Council Member Carter. Um, so I, I, it is illegal for those who are under 21 to possess and smoke or use mar uh, THC products, according to state law. So there would be enforcement ability there in that situation. If a police officer drove by and saw youth using marijuana products, like there, it is illegal for youth to use those products. So maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but... No, it, you you aren't. Um, it you know taking a hit off of a off of a, you know a, of a smoke and keep continuing to walk makes that timeline really unenforceable, right? Well, sure, in examples like that. But if there were a group of kids using products, sure, absolutely. If they were hanging out and chilling, and they're on their third whatever. Like sure, yeah. Just like if a, somebody was walking down the street and there was somebody holding a drink and they took a drink of it and walked away. Well, I mean, like, yes. And not to, not to belabor the point, but the difference between how I, how high I might get off of one drag versus how high I might get off of one sip. These are where we get into the weird gray lines. A lot, yeah. lot of weird gray lines. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Zuniga, don't, don't hustle away there. Let's <laughs> <laughs> <Nice> try. <laughs> yeah. uh, you have something to add? Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, I was just going to add, not only is it illegal for a minor to use it and possess it, but it's also illegal for someone over three years older than the minor to provide it to the minor as well. Thank you. Council Member uh, Lohman. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is quite the discussion. I see uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro arguing with herself. That's that's quite the uh, <laughs> quite the uh, quite the uh, evening. Um, so I guess uh, you know the way I look at it, unless we were to um, you know take tobacco products and then you know put that in the realm of alcohol, I just don't know how we would you know look at that as being an intoxicating piece, and I just don't know. <clears throat> I, I don't know, that would probably make us quite an outlier if we did that too. And so <clears throat> I think uh, short of anything else, I think we're kind of stuck, in my opinion, uh, with that enhanced uh, prohibitions uh, consistent with the tobacco um, prohibitions that we have, you know, it, with this one. You know, unless, you know, I mean, 
I certainly wouldn't have a problem with being an outlier. Uh, but I mean, that's pretty extreme to take cigarette smoke uh, uh, to to that that level of of, uh, of enforcement. Um, but it would make it consistent. So, um, but I mean, I may be one of one of seven people up here who would be interested in doing that. So, um, I, I think we're really stuck in that that middle one. Councilmember Nelson. Are you going to bind us all up here? Or? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to make it easy. I, I, in general, agree with the tobacco, make it the same as that, just for enforceability. I will be candid, and I don't think we can address it tonight. Um, I, I am concerned about the gummies and the edibles. I mean, we spent a lot of time doing um, flavored tobacco because we thought it was a way for kids to get it, and now apparently you can get um, flavored candies that are intoxicating. and yeah. And, you know, I'm like, that's just a weird place that we're at, you, can, you know, in my mind you know, as a city. Um, the And I do have concerns about that being in a park, you know. I mean, that falls out of your pocket or something like that. I mean, it's not – I mean, you could have a really small kid coming up and getting that. And I don't think you're going to have a really small kid coming up and grabbing a beer out of the cooler, opening it up, and pounding it back, you know. So, you know, that is a concern. Again, I don't – I'm not trying to bind anything up here, Mayor, and, and I don't think it's something we need to address tonight, but it is an ongoing concern though, in terms of the difference of how we handled flavored tobaccos and the difference in the options we have to handle flavored products that are intoxicating. Uh, I, I, I would agree with you. Uh, just one moment, Councilmember Carter. I, I would agree with you, and honestly, my thought is that the, the gummies and the hard candy are going to be more prevalent than the smoking because, I mean, nobody likes the smoke. Right, I mean that's it's it's obvious, it's stinky, it's but a, a gummy is an entirely different thing. So I think you're you're exactly right in terms of uh, ultimately what the use is, is going to end up being. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I will say I was at Valley Fair on Friday and I smelled um, uh, marijuana products several times. Mm. So some I'm just saying. Um, uh, so people are definitely smoking it in other places, but. Um, I'm just wondering for this one specifically, and maybe for the other two too, but uh, our advisory board of health has spent a lot of time on our tobacco policy work, and obviously is our advisory board of health, and I'm wondering if um, we could get them to weigh in on this one especially, because um, I do think, I mean, I think we're all bringing up very valid points and concerns, um, but I think I'd be interested to know what that group um would say and, and what Dr. Kelly and the public health team would recommend to. I'm assuming they've been part of the conversations, but. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's probably good direction. I think just counting noses here, I'm, I'm seeing the prohibitions consistent with the tobacco prohibitions, I think is the group consensus here. But I, I agree, that's a good point. Our advisory board of health should probably weigh in on all of the discussion that we're having here and all the different possibilities. That would be helpful. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. If I might just suggest that we do that as a two-step process, I think we could probably move this part of it forward and then have them further review it. I, I, that, that was my intention. Yep, okay, I agree. Yep. And, and right now we're basically giving staff direction. Uh, to, to we're, we're not voting on anything here. We're giving staff direction as to how to work toward this, uh, this ordinance. So I think we have clarity on that. Uh, the next policy question... Councilmember D'Alessandro. I, I just one of the things that wasn't in that first one was just whether or not we have the opportunity to um, increase enforcement penalties, uh, if that's possible. I, I just we haven't. I don't know if since my time on council if we've addressed whether or not. I, I, my biggest concern related to the notion of like the edibles and stuff like that is that um, if we're not literally in these retail establishments every day all the time like watching this stuff like a hawk I mean, you know you're, you're up you're up to you're up to like people's honor system if you will um unless we can provide like more more both education and and direction as it relates to where and when and why and all that kind of stuff but then also that we maybe increase the enforcement actions and i don't know if there were any that we could choose from that are would not put us in violation of state law but i uh, you know, I, I think that might be valid. Uh, Council Member, are you talking enforcement actions for sales or for use of? Um, or, or where you use it, basically. If somebody's on, you know, if somebody's in the park, can we find them 
five hundred bucks for it, or are you talking the? Uh, yeah, I mean sales? that's a, that's an open question, right? For yeah. you, I know we're getting to sales, but for use as well, I just don't know even know what our penalties are, and should we revisit those and look at, at you know more strict enforcement, um, you know m- a, a bigger stick. I don't know if yep. another way to put it. Yep. Yeah. And and I don't know. I'd, I'd look to Mr. Zuniga. I don't know if if that is something we can do locally or if that's structured by the state. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, the statute does limit our ability on an enforcement. And for use and possession, it limits it to a petty misdemeanor, which is a fine of not more than $300. No, but that, that's a good point. I think the continuing conversation, and I'm guessing we're one of many, many cities who are probably having some of the same conversations. So to our next discussion point. Allow liquor stores to sell lower potency hemp edible products. Councilman Dallas Hadro. I do have one specific comment on this, which I think I brought up going back to when we did our our, our original edible question um, and um, and giving tobacco um, uh, s- stores the ability to sell it. I was disappointed that the five hundred foot setback was kind of tucked in there and we never had a discussion in the public forum about 500 versus 300 versus 250 and and so I'd really like to see us get consistent with that if it's 300 it's 300 for the whole thing like and and I I don't think that we should make an arbitrary challenge to the enforcement here because I, I do know for example that we have a tobacco store that is prohibited currently by virtue of 50 feet, <laughs> uh, you know, because we did that, but we didn't talk about it as a council. And so, and I don't mean to disparage anybody, it just was weird that it all of a sudden was, it, it's the only thing that was inconsistent with our tobacco stuff on the on the edible side was that we just decided to add 200 extra feet and it just seemed weird. So um, I'd like to get us to that consistency. So I'd be very much in, in, in favor of like getting that all together at 300, if that's the right answer. Um, and, you know, that's liquor, that's tobacco, that's cannabis. That's so, my opinion there. So that was helpful. You're uh, under allowing sales by liquor stores, but you're bullet point two to make sure everybody is modified and consistent. Um, yes. Should should we allow them to do it? Yep. I'd want it. I'd want the cannabis one to change so that it was consistent. That's I, right. I, I, In fact, I'd like it to change either way because it's already inconsistent on tobacco. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Council, other thoughts on this? I, I, I would generally agree with Councilmember D'Alessandro, I think, uh, to make it consistent, again, just for for sake of consistency, fairness, and, frankly, ease, it probably makes the most sense uh, to modify those setbacks. Um, now, whether or not to, uh, and we've already got it, uh, the, the, or allowing the sales in the liquor store and, and other spots, I think it makes, again, consistent sense with what we're doing now. I, Councilmember Lohman? Uh, yeah, no, I think what you said makes a lot of sense. My only, I just a thought occurred to me. Can you uh, grow a tobacco plant in the back of your, your yard? Mm-hmm. Um, Mayor and Councilmember Lohman, you can, but it needs to be um, within a locked enclosure and not um, viewable from a public space. Okay. And is there any limits on that in terms of how many you can have, or is it? I'm sorry, did you say tobacco or uh, tobacco? Cannabis? Yeah, I'm saying tobacco, not not the. Well, yeah, I don't think we have a specific or city ordinance that would I, I prohibit you. I don't think you could grow it here. I don't know that we have the environment it, for it, yeah. but it, you can't. You could grow it here. You can't grow it here. You could, you know, you couldn't even grow that inside. I mean, it'd be yeah. too complicated to be able to. I should know them. I've got family members that, that grow tobacco. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I guess. Uh, so I guess my thing is, is as I look at this, is that's kind of my lens, you know, with the, with you know the fact that you could you could grow this stuff in the backyard, and so I, I'm kind of like, I mean, not the edibles, of course, I mean, because that's <laughs> you're putting in there, but I, I I sort of uh, have kind of backed off of, you know, what difference does a 500 foot uh, or 300 foot. Uh, you know, barrier really mean if you can, you know, just go in somebody's backyard. And I mean, yes, it's locked up, but it's there. So, um, so I guess when I, as I'm looking at this, I just I don't know, you know, wh- what do we really gain from uh, from any of this? So I'm pretty open to what what other folks are are kind of open to wanting to do, and I, I'm just more concerned about the um, 
as uh, uh, my colleague over here um, is, is talking about some of these edibles and being able to utilize them out out in the public mm-hmm. and how do we how do we enforce that how do we protect our folks it seems like it's the same you know, flavored thing all over again to me but just in a different form also anybody with other strong thoughts either way one way or another it looks like we're up to kind of three nodding heads on the modifying the setback so it's consistent with existing liquor store setback of 300 feet any strong feelings one way or another on that Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm fine with that. And then I guess I know that the decision was to have the Advisory Board of Health to look at all three of these. And again, I think it's kind of going back to the the edible issue um, and how we <clears throat> kind of think about that as a community um, and what we can do about that. And so um, I think so. I think the bigger question I'm not totally sure about, and I would love to have kind of more of that public health presentation on this issue. Um, but kind of specific to the setbacks, I'm, I'm fine making it consistent. Councilmember Dallas, are, are you indicating you're fine as well, or do you have another point to make? Um, that we're I, I had a, what we've I had already a, decided here. No, no, I had a different point to make. Oh, okay. Actually, if that was okay, a, a, a clarification, and then a, a, a point on another section of this. Um, w- one is, um, again, I'd, I'd just like if if you remove it, then if you're a tobacco store that sells cannabis you're subject to your tobacco setback if you're a liquor store and you sell cannabis you're subject to your liquor store setback so i'm not quite sure unless we're talking about cannabis only just like retailers why we need a separate setback for cannabis that so i throw that out there as an idea and and i think that's a good point and i think maybe we could in in the context of this we'll make this decision but then perhaps ask yeah just uh, an open question for me to to reconsider our our tobacco setbacks as well to make them consistent with the if we're making this consistent with tobacco uh do we make it consistant with tobacco sales shops as well right Uh, miss scipioni mayor council member de alessandro i just want to clarify we don't currently have a setback for tobacco because we don't issue new tobacco licenses um so we, you know, we're talking about consistency. We currently have a setback for our off-sale liquor stores, um, and we have one for the hemp edibles, but we do not currently have a tobacco setback in our ordinance. We we did when we were issuing licenses, though, right? Because I'm pretty sure it was like 250 feet or something. I remember when Mr. Junker came forward and talked to us about the cannabis ordinance the first time, or the hemp ordinance the first time that there was a discrepancy there uh, there wasn't a discrepancy until after the fact but there was a rule at the time maybe i'm wrong about that but if we're if we don't care about the tobacco piece that's fine um i just i just like i don't know there's like if you're in a tobacco store and you want to sell cannabis you're subject to whatever the regulations are for tobacco and if that just seems easier to me, but I could be wrong. Okay, so that's fine. You guys, yeah, take that back and do what you want. And, to do and, and why don't we, I mean, if there is some clarification to be had there, if you could. Well, and Mayor and Council Member De Alessandro, so um, it's not just um, tobacco stores and um, exclusive liquor stores that can sell um, the lower potency hemp edible products. And so um, that's why there's a, a separate setback in city code because you may have a shop that isn't subject to a t- well, tobacco, we don't issue those licenses, but isn't a liquor store, so it's not subject to that 300-foot setback. Um, and so the code has a, its own setback for those businesses that that's the only um, kind of control product that it's selling or licensed product that it's selling. Um, like, for example, if I had a, if I was a, um, 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 a, I don't know, a gift shop and I wanted to... Mm-hmm where I was a gas station. And if I sold 3-2 beer, I already have a regulation then. But if I don't sell 3-2 beer, I don't. Is that right? Mayor or you're Con- saying the cannabis one? Mayor and Council Member D'Alessandro, um, so if you're not selling alcohol within your gas station, but then you decide you want to sell the lower potency hemp edibles, you you would only be subject to the lower potency hemp edible set, setback. There wouldn't be another one that kind of exists for right. your okay. establishment. Okay, I understand. I'll... I'll, I'll um, I'll I'll return to my original thing, which is liquor stores make them the same. I, there's a whole thing about about I'm just concerned about enforcement because I think you go into 
a gas station and you buy an edible and they're not enforcing that any better than they're enforcing their tobacco. <laughs> and there was a reason we banned flavored tobacco because we knew that they weren't necessarily enforcing the rules and that people were marketing to kids and, and everything else. I don't know. There's an argument to be made here that you have to be an exclusive, like you have to be an exclusive store of things that people who are 21 can go get. And that's it. That's where you sell it. I don't know. That's my opinion. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm okay with the it being sold at liquor stores. Um, it's my understanding that this would not be an exclusive right for the liquor stores. It would just be something new because they were originally not allowed to do it. So this would just be in addition to the other places that are already able to sell it. Mayor and Councilmember Nelson, that is correct. Okay. I agree with uh, consistency on the setbacks, um, and I would note that I believe uh, communities that have municipal liquor stores that aren't too far away, Edina and Lakeville, mm -hmm. I believe they're both already selling THC products in their municipal stores. Um, and two, one well, of the points that somebody made, um, in terms of penalties, I saw that Edina on the sale uh, use their alcohol penalties as opposed to the sale of tobacco penalties. So if you sell to a minor, they were, you know, it was significantly more expensive than if you sold them a pack of cigarettes um, accidentally. And so I would like to look at that in utilizing alcohol um, penalties for sale to minors given the intoxication effects. Councilmember Loman. Ever so briefly, I guess I was wrong. You can grow tobacco in Minnesota. Apparently, uh, well, they used to do it in Meeker County. I think you can grow hemp. But no, I this is this is tobacco. No, this is tobacco here. I just, okay. just saw it here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's online, so it's true. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I don't see why the historical society would lie about something like that, but uh, <laughs> I'm wrong. Shady group, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on to the, the, the third of our three policy discussions that we wanted to have regarding the cannabis sales moratorium. Um, I know there are cities all around us that have enacted a moratorium. Um, there are cities that have not acted a more enacted moratoriums. Have, have others dis deferred the, the decision until spring of 2024? Um, Mayor and City Council, I I think there are some that were very anxious to put a moratorium in place right away um, to kind of make sure they had the time and space to make that decision. I haven't heard from too many of my colleagues that they're kind of, yeah, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, but we certainly wanted to lay it out there as an option that there isn't, well, we may want to discuss it now, there isn't anything that says we can't come back to it at a later date. Um, and we kind of threw spring 2024 out there because that's when we expect to get underway with the rest of our ordinance amendments and have a better idea of exactly what that timing looks like and what the state is doing. Um, but really at any time, the city council could decide to enact a moratorium um, through December of 2024. Thoughts on this council? Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I'm fine waiting and just seeing where the state's at and seeing how long it takes us to get through this. Um, I got confidence that our staff, if they see like, hey, this is taking us longer, if we're working with our advisory board of health and going through a really robust process and you think you need more time, come back and ask for the moratorium then. See a thumbs up here. I mean, that, that's what I was thinking as well. I don't know. I would hate to say we're never going to enact a moratorium. I'd hate to jump in and do one now. I think the decision to wait until spring of 2024, um, see where the state is at the time, and make a decision then. There's no great rush either way, I don't think. Any opposing views there? There you go. <laughs> Thank you for being the voice of reason, Council Member Nelson. Is there anything else you need from us on this topic? <laughs> there is not, Mayor and Council. I thank you very much. Thank you. And again, Council, thanks for the good discussion on this. I think there's brought up a lot of good points that we all need to talk about, and I, I think cities everywhere need to work their way through that. Council Member Carter? Thank you, Mayor. Is there any plan for um, stakeholder or community engagement? I know some there are limited spaces that we have regulatory control, so I know we want to be careful 
with the kind of input we'd be seeking, but I'm just curious if staff have talked about, you know, if there are certain pieces of this that we want to engage certain stakeholders or residents. Mr. Verbrugge? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, as we go forward in the process, there are a number of other policy issues that are going to come up. Uh, and so th there are things that we do want to get input from the community on um, <clears throat> that frankly are maybe a little more substantial than what we talked about today. And we'll take a little bit more um, thoughtful design in terms of how we try to uh, invite constructive conversation. Could I, I can imagine a topic like this is going to invite some unconstructive conversation as well right so um we are we are talking about it and uh, as we go through uh, get, get further into the process we'll bring back to council what some of those suggestions are going to be thank you yeah. council member d'alessandro just a, a quick uh, follow-up to that mr mayor thank you um uh, i want to as always uh the presentation did a great job, I think, of of summarizing um, not only the timeline but also the the regular taking that massive document and turning it into a PowerPoint slide that we could all kind of you know rock was pretty good. Um, I th actually think a public interest piece on this is valid, an educational piece, because I think setting the context for for the public about what we do have control over and what we don't is really important and. Um, because otherwise you set yourself up for conversations that frustrate people and then we can't do anything about them anyway. So I don't know if that's something that we could do a video on or if it's um, uh, something we could do a, a, a pub, you know, a Bloomington briefing, you know, story on or something, but something that gives uh, the public a good, like, here's where we are at and here's what we have control over and what we don't. And that's why we're looking at these three things as opposed to all the other things you might think of because these are the ones we have control over. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, I'd agree with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, you know, there's also going to be uh, a discussion about uh, revenue that comes to local units of government as well because obviously the the legislature included uh, a, a component there for how the tax is going to be distributed. And I think at some point we're going to need to have a conversation about how we uh, philosophically want to utilize those allocations that come to the city. I've heard discussion tonight about public safety and about public health. Uh, and you know, anytime there's a new revenue stream that's presented to the, to the city, we want to be thoughtful about how we're um, utilizing that. Uh, <clears throat> there are also other revenue potentials. The law gives local units of government the opportunity to get licenses uh, for dispensary or retail services just as anybody else would. Uh, but it doesn't have the same sort of um, the same sort of parameters that the um, state does around um, liquor. And so, you know, municipalities that would be able to have their own uh, liquor operation essentially have a monopoly and that private liquor uh, operations are not allowed within a, a city that has um, public. That component is not in this bill. So uh, understanding, you know, what sort of that uh, competitive or private um a dynamic looks like is something that we'll want to take a look at as well. So like I said, there are a number of different uh, policy issues beyond the ones that we talked about tonight. And as we move uh, further uh, into the implementation phase and learn more about the rulemaking process and uh, how the Office of Cannabis Management is going to approach some of these issues, uh, we'll bring those back to the council for further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Verrugge. And agreed, I think more public information, the better and education on this, the better, so. Very good, thank you. And now don't go far. <laughs> <laughs> item five, <laughs> item 5.2 on our agenda is an update on our 2023 municipal election. Yes, Mayor and Council, you're stuck with me for a little bit longer. Let's bring up our presentation here. And really, the purpose of this update is um, to provide some information to the council and to the viewing public about kind of what we can expect over the, the course of this municipal election cycle, um, what we can expect with our RCV tabulation and our election night reporting. Um, so I'll go to the second slide here. All right, we're going to talk about some resources for our voters, some key election dates that we have coming up. 
um, how we're going to report results on election night, um, what the RCV tabulation process will look like in 2023, um, when the canvassing board will be, and then um, some information about a post-election review, which is um, new to us here in Bloomington. So some resources for our voters. Um, the Secretary of State's website is always a great place to send voters when, they're want, when they want to know, am I registered? Where do I register? Um, what is, where's my polling place? Where do I go to vote? Um, voters can actually look up their exact sample ballot for their precinct on that Secretary of State's website. Um, I will point out that the state very recently updated that to mnvotes.gov. It used to be mnvotes.org. Um, so if you see mnvotes.org, that website still works, um, and it's actually in a lot of the materials we have because we learned very, very recently <laughs> about the change. Um, but mnvotes.gov is a legitimate website. That's the new website um, or the new URL that the state is using moving forward for their site. Um, and then Hennepin County's website becomes especially important during our off-year off -year election cycles. Um, for those who want to vote absentee by mail, they actually have to work directly with Hennepin County for that application process. So you may remember in a even year at election, right, you can go on the Secretary of State's website and you can submit an online absentee ballot application and have that ballot sent directly to your home. Um, the law does not allow the Secretary of State's office to turn that online application on for our off-year elections. So <laughs> sometimes you'll hear people say or, you know, hear voters say, well, they I can't go online and I can't apply. And that is correct to a certain extent. They can go onto the county's website and download that application and then submit that application to the county via email. And they, a lot of people will just take a, a picture of it um, and then submit that picture to the county. But it is a little bit more cumbersome of a process um, than we have in the even numbered election years. So I just like to point that out for folks. Um, also, uh, for any of our military or overseas voters, Hennepin County handles all of those as well. So if someone's um, temporarily overseas, serving in the military, um, those are a different ballot issuance process. And so that's all done at the county level. Some important election dates. So we're coming up on September 22nd, which is when um, in-person early voting begins. Um, and we are actually creating a, a temporary space in our lobby this year. We'll have um, kind of temporary walls draping up and using the Dakota um, for all of our secure election storage. Um, so it'll be very easy for members of the public to come in. You walk in on either side of the lobby doors and there's our election, there's our polling place for anybody in Bloomington who'd like to come and vote early. Um, we're open regular business hours, 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Um, we're also open the Saturday before the election from 9 to 3, and we stay open until 5 um, on the Monday before the election. For anybody who wants to register ahead of time on election day because either they haven't voted before, they've changed their name or changed their address, um, that cutoff is October 17th. So if I want to be able to walk into my polling place and say, hey, I'm Christina Scipioni and I live at 1234 Main Street um, and have my name on the roster, I need to make sure that I'm registered by October 17th. Um, anybody who isn't registered by that date can still register to vote on election day, um, but they do need to show additional proof of residence in order to be able to do that. Um, same thing if they want to come vote early in person and they're not yet registered, they go through that same um, voter registration application process and showing proof of residence here with us. Something we're excited about this year, um, this last legislative session, they have in the state increased the time frame for direct balloting. So that is the process where the voter, when they come to vote early and in person, instead of um, taking their ballot and putting it into a series of envelopes, they can feed it directly through the ballot counter. The benefit to the voter is that they're then able to receive immediate feedback from the ballot counter if they've made a mistake. Right? If I selected too many candidates in one race, it will tell you that. If I brought in a highlighter and used a highlighter on that ballot and the ballot can't find any votes on it, it will tell you that, right? And then the voter can go and fix their, fix their mistakes with a fresh ballot. Um, so that used to be just seven days before the election, and now it is 18 days. So that actually starts on October 20th this year. And again, we have additional hours, right, that were open for voting. And then, of course, the big day, November 7th, um, is election day. And as always, our polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
So once those polls close, what does results reporting look like when we have RCV races on the ballot? Right. The first source for election night results is going to be mnvotes.org or gov, whatever you prefer, the Secretary of State's website. Um, so the way that the Secretary of State reports out those results is they list every ranking and how many votes each candidate got in each ranking. And so I'll show you what that looks like. I'm sorry this is a little bit small, but this is actually a sample from our 2021 District 3 election. And so you can see there's a first choice, a second choice, a third choice, and then how many votes each candidate received in each of those rankings. So what this does not provide us is a couple of things. It doesn't provide RCV tabulation. It also doesn't report overvotes and undervotes. And so that's very important for RCV tabulation because on election night to determine if a candidate does, if a race needs um, tabulation rounds, we look at all of the votes cast for that race to see if there's any candidate that has 50% plus one vote of all of the votes cast in that race. And because the Secretary of State doesn't report out undervotes, where a voter doesn't choose to vote in that race, and they don't report out overvotes, where someone selected too many candidates in a ranking, um, we are unable to just look at the Secretary of State's race and say, OK, this candidate received 51%. We actually get a report on election night from the county that gives us the total number of votes cast. And then we report out on our website, on the Bloomington website, um, the first choice rankings that include the overvotes and the undervotes. So for that same race, if you only looked at the Secretary of State's website and the reporting for first choice votes, we had a candidate who looked like they received 51%. But then when we report out, this is what it looks like on election night, and you can see we have overvotes and undervotes included. So we have all of the ballots cast, and that actually brought that candidate down to just under 50%. And so we recommend, right, if a race is, you should look at our website anyway, because it's great. But if a race is close, right, if it's 50, 51, 52%, you're really going to want to take a look at our RCV tabulation results, right, and our election night report, I'm sorry, our election night reporting to make sure that you're taking a look at the total votes cast and what that maximum threshold is to see if any candidate has, um, has met that maximum threshold. So on election night, Secretary of State's office and then our website will provide the detailed analysis of undervotes and overvotes for every race. And then we will know which races are going to require tabulation rounds because the candidate hasn't met that 50% plus one threshold. So when we do tabulation rounds this year, we will actually um, we'll complete them by contest for any of the contests that require them. Um, and this is the order that we'll be moving in this year. You may remember in 2021 that we started with the districts and then moved to the at-large race. Um, but because we are switching to um, a spreadsheet tabulation method, it's actually just as efficient to start with the citywide races and then move through the district races. Again. Not every race on this list will probably require tabulation rounds, but we would start at the top and then just move through the ones that do require tabulation rounds. So I'm excited to announce that tabulation rounds will actually begin on Wednesday, the day after the election in the afternoon. Um, and the reason for that is we are using the spreadsheet tabulation method this year. So you remember two years ago, we physically moved all of the ballots and it took us three days to count three races and do those tabulation rounds. Um, now we will have trained staff who work in pairs at City Hall using what's called the cast vote record. And so this is an example of what that cast vote record looks like for a particular race. And basically what it is is a spreadsheet where every single row on that race is a different ballot in that candidate's or in that voter's choices for that ballot. And so there is a process by which the pairs of um, employees are sorting that information and doing the same process as you would with physical ballots, except it's much faster because you can use Excel and hit sort. And then you can use Excel to count, right, the number that you have. Um, and so we expect that to speed up our results reporting quite a bit. Um, the other benefit is we can start earlier because 
we can electronically receive the cast vote record from Hennepin County instead of having to um, actually physically go get all of the absentee ballots um, as we did in 2021. So we have guardrails in place, we have checks in place for this process. So for every race, you have two different pairs of staff that are working separately, right? And then there are defined check-in throughout the process. So that if they don't, when they come together and their numbers don't meet, they have to go back and check where that mistake was made, right? We don't move forward until we know that both teams have the exact same result for that tabulation record. We also save all of those spreadsheets at each part in the process. So we have a very transparent process of how that data was sorted um, and how those results were tabulated for that race. So using that cast vote record again, the tabulation teams are going to sort the ballast by the highest continuing candidate ranking on the ballot. And so you, in 2021, you may remember that threshold for declaring um, or determining if a candidate has met that 50% plus one, that changes during tabulation rounds. So on election night, we are taking a look at all of the votes cast. Once we start doing tabulation rounds, some ballots actually become inactive, um, maybe because they don't have a continuing candidate on them or because the voter chose not to vote in that race at all um, or a voter overvoted in every single um, race on the ballot and we can't determine their intent. Um, and so what we do during tabulation rounds is we take that um, total number of ballots and we remove out those inactive ballots and then that divided by two plus one is our new threshold. Um, so as we're reporting out, um, you'll see, for example, in the District 3 race, once we went through and did our first tabulation round, we took out 196 inactive ballots, right? That was removed from our threshold. Um, and then we had a candidate that met the 50% plus one threshold. So we did receive a lot of questions in 2021 um, about, well, how come that changes every time? And it's because we have what's called a dynamic threshold that changes um, as our number of inactive ballots becomes larger. So if after that first round of tabulation, we don't have a candidate that meets that 50% plus one threshold, then the candidate with the lowest number of votes and any candidate for whom it's mathematically impossible to be elected are eliminated. And then we take a look at their next highest continuing candidate, and their vote is moved to their next highest continuing, continuing candidate. So you can see here in District 4, um, where we eliminated um, um, uh, Angela Coyle and Becky Strohmeyer, and then their votes were redistributed to the continuing candidates, Victor Rivas and Patrick Martin. Right. And then we do the same analysis to determine our threshold. Um, and then we determine if any candidate has met that threshold. So you can see this one required two rounds of tabulation. So we declare an unofficial winner, right, when that candidate has met that threshold, or if only two candidates remain, the candidate with the highest number of votes is elected. As we're going through these tabulation rounds, we will report the results in two places. It will be physically posted here at Civic Plaza, and then they will also be posted online um, on our website. Um, and after, they'll, they'll be reported after every single tabulation round, not just after the tabulation for that complete race. So after every round, you will see new tabulations um, on our website. Okay. Once we have tabulation complete, um, the city council serves as the canvassing board. Um, so we need to notice that meeting date at least three days in advance. We are tentatively planning on the Monday, November 13th city council meeting. Um, if we have a substantial number of races that require tabulation rounds, we may need to push that canvassing date out later to make sure that our staff have enough time to tabulate. I don't anticipate that being the case, but I just want to preview that for you just in case. Um, we have to canvass the results by Friday, November 17th. And Christina, actually, I have a question because you said if we, if we have a number Realistically, we could only have two races that would have tabulation rounds, correct? 
Uh, Marin City Council, that is correct, except for um, instances where our election night threshold includes a lot of um, ballots with undervotes and overvotes. So if we had a race, let's say that there's only two candidates, but a lot of voters chose to skip that race entirely, uh, okay. that could change our threshold. Got it. So once we do the tabulation rounds and remove any ballots where those voters chose not to cast a vote, then it's likely going to be one tabulation round, but that okay. still would require a round. That makes sense. All right, thank you. And this is pretty exciting this year. We didn't do this in 2021 um, because it wasn't required. But this year, because we are using the spreadsheet tabulation, we are actually doing what's called a post-election review. Um, and it's very similar to the process that is um, done at the state level uh, when we have statewide races on the ballot. Um, so we do a public hand count of one race. Um, if there's a district race, we do a district race. If there aren't any district races that required um, tabulation rounds, then we would move to a, a citywide race. And I should clarify, this process is only required if tabulation rounds are required. So if on election night none of the races require tabulation rounds, we would not do this process. But for any of the race, for if we do require tabulation round in at least one race, then we move to the post-election review. Um, so it'll be set up very similar to our RCV tabulation center that we had, and the public can come in and they can watch that process as we physically move the ballots through tabulation. It also allows us to ensure that our hand count tabulation matches our spreadsheet tabulation. We are planning that for Tuesday, November 21st at 9 a.m. in the Black Box Theater. So mark your calendars. Um, and again, it's open to the public so anybody can come watch that fun process. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 you're great. Just a quick question. On, yes. Yeah, I know. Look at that question. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Um, the, in the event that the hand tabulation and the spreadsheet tabulation don't match mm -hmm. during this process, what's the remedy there? Is it hand count wins, or how does that work? Uh, Mayor and Councilmember D'Alessandro, sometimes there are small discrepancies. Um, when you are doing the spreadsheet tabulation, we are not viewing an actual ballot, so you can't determine voter intent. Um, so sometimes a voter may have an overvote in a race, and that's what the machine reports out, and that's what ends up on our spreadsheet, right? But when we actually physically look at the ballot, they've written in this one, right? And so sometimes you will see differences like that. Um, but overall, if there is a significant difference between the hand count and the spreadsheet tabulation, and it's not for things like that that can be explained, um, then we move to the hand tabulation, right? Um, and that can actually cause us to go retabulate, depending on the difference um, between the two. It can actually cause us trigger a hand tabulation of all of our um, tabulated races. Thanks. Other questions, Council? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. She always does a great job. <laughs> you guys are well, very kind. So you had to listen to me for quite a while tonight. All right. Well, nothing Thank else. You. Thank you so very much. That brings us council. As I find all my stuff. That brings us to our final agenda item of the evening, our city council policy and issue update, item 5.3. Our first uh, order of business here is a recap of the listening session. We had four speakers this evening. Uh, Larry Frost had uh, some comments and concerns about council comments during a listening session regarding some uh, uh, alleged pictures that showed up on websites. Mike, uh, or excuse me, Kent Bolson had he had a question about the the levy language with the HRA and the Port Authority and the request for 2024 that the language in the levy requests uh, didn't specify uh, the, the shift that was made this year between the, the HRA and the Port Authority. And he thought it was, I mean, he made the good point that it was good news and we should be, we'd be doing a better job of really telling that story. So I appreciated Kent coming forward and bringing that to our attention. Uh, Ava McKnight and other speakers for uh, BuzzFest came 
before us and they were looking for support for alt lawns and that event BuzzFest is actually taking place on Saturday the 16th at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Moyer Park and encourage people to get there and then uh, Mike and I missed Mike's last name help me here list Mike list thank you very much uh, continuing to have issues with the group home that abuts his house from behind he had questions about the level of supervision for residents as well as the conduct of some of the staff members and uh, we have uh, agreed that the city is going to take the step of notifying the uh, licensing agency we believe it's the state in this instance to try and look into some of these concerns and work with the neighbors to address some of these issues um, I think with well, Mike has been by in the past, but that gives us again three of four speakers tonight, our first time speakers at our listening session. So once again, our goal of trying to get more people to come and speak to the council uh, during the listening session on a variety of topics, I think we're, we're managing to do so with our listening sessions. That is all I have. Actually, I would, would, uh, what if one other thing, uh, the On the One Festival on Saturday was very cool. If you got, I know, I think Council Member D'Alessandro had a chance to get there. I stopped by and just a, a, a great afternoon and evening of music and um, just kind of a, a general vibe of the area was was just very positive and really really a, a good feeling looking forward to it talked with uh, the promoter the the producer the, the head of avant-garde the production company that does it and looking for opportunities to make it bigger and better and I told them we definitely were on board with that and we try and find ways to make it all work so uh, good show once again this year that's all I had. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, anything from the city manager's desk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. i got a couple items. Uh, first of all, just a reminder that Bloomington Pride is coming up on Sunday, September 10th. And again, we'll have a, a table for city council to be there. So please let me or Matt Brillhart know if uh, you will be there. And uh, we'll make sure that everything is situated. Uh, so again, that's happening here at Civic Plaza on Sunday, September 10th. Uh, really nice community event that we've had for the last couple of years. Been very successful. Hope it continues to grow. Uh, the other, <clears throat> similar to On the One, uh, second year for that, so I'm glad you mentioned that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, glad to see that growing as well. I also want to um, acknowledge that uh, late last week we had, a, we had a homicide in Bloomington, a very unfortunate situation. Uh, nephew of uh, a couple in their 70s uh, is the suspect in that case. And um, uh, unfortunate, very unfortunate event. What I, what I want to just acknowledge tonight is, again, the tremendous work done by the Bloomington Police Department uh, in responding immediately to that call, uh, being there uh, so promptly that uh, they were able to apprehend the suspect uh, in the area uh, right away and uh, delivered uh, emergency first aid to both of the victims. Unfortunately, one of them did die. And um, uh, again, making sure that uh, things, that, when they happen like this in Bloomington, um, people, people are held to account. And uh, they did tremendous work uh, uh, in, that, in that particular case. And I, I don't want to miss an opportunity to call them out and say thank you for uh, the work that they're doing. Well said, Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you. Council, anything to add tonight? Council Member D'Alessandro. Um, just because it was, I, I, I think I said I was going to kind of defer my comments on this to the um, to the, the section. Um, we know, I mean, we're practically in crisis mode as it relates to trees in the city. Um, number one, they can't come down because we don't have enough resources for it. Number two, they're dying quickly uh, because of the drought and, and everything, and we can't water them fast enough. I, I'd like to... I made him mention that, you know, this certainly what we passed in consent agenda tonight was great. Um, going out and getting those resources from the DNR is really smart. There's also a Hennepin County program um, that does something similar that I think if we aren't taking advantage of, we should. Um, but, you know, our residents are having some challenges, right? They, they, they can't find people to take those trees down. Then we assess them, but we don't go get them. And then, you know, there's like a whole lot of of just backlog there. And of course, we don't really have an effective replacement program in, in mind either, which is a part of what I believe we're trying to study. Um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that, you know, this to me feels like the kind of thing that um, our strategic priorities fund can help with. And so, you know, to the extent that we could study like what it would take for us to really get from way behind to parity here, um, 
I think that would be important at this stage, um, especially not just to take them down, but to get them replaced. Um, you know, um, incentives like that. There are cool cool programs. Um, I think Hopkins has one. Minneapolis has one. That that's actually like a, a, a set aside like program for. Um, you know, that you literally fund a green program that says, if you're doing these kinds of things, we will support you with, you know, maybe 50% of the cost or whatever. And I, um, I don't know if that's something we can do in the case of tree canopy, but it's a, it's burgeoning on a crisis. I had like half the flower, the, the, um, sing songbirds that I normally do in my yard, um, because I had to take an at one of my ash trees down and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, an environmental impact that we just can't necessarily wrap our heads around right now. But, um, the sooner we can do something about it, I think the better, um, great trees available, oak trees, you know, um, crab apples, all kinds of other cool trees that we could be planting that, um, will sustain itself 50, 70 years. Um, so, you know, no reason not to try to get those in the ground as soon as possible my opinion. So throw that out there. I don't know if you guys want to consider that at all, but um, it feels like the right kind of thing to do. We have strategic priority for crisis management around climate, and we have the, the funds to potentially help us out here. Um, so I throw that out. Thanks. Mr. Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, as Council is aware, we'll have a number of budget conversations coming up uh, in October and November of this year. And uh, when we talk about parks and recreation, uh, that's a prime opportunity to talk about our forestry program. We'll also, I think, uh, carve out some time just to talk about the Strategic Priorities Fund and the utilization of those dollars and what the council would like to look at over the next uh, year or two uh, in terms of how we allocate that um, because we can provide an update to the council on what the balance is there and then talk about where you want to focus some of those um, directives. Anything else, Council? Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was debating whether or not to bring this up. So um, a couple months ago, Councilmember Lohman and I received an email from a gentleman who uh, he and his partner had bought a condo in a building in Bloomington and later found out that they had next-door neighbors that smoked inside their unit, and it really affected them. And I know we've had conversations around smoke-free housing, and um, we haven't moved those conversations forward for a variety of reasons. But um, one of the ideas that the gentleman had was around mandatory disclosures. So if an apartment building or a condo building did allow smoking, and, and I'm thinking about this because of tonight's conversation around um, smoking uh, marijuana products, cannabis products, um, I am wondering if maybe that's a policy we want to look at, um, again, especially with these new conversations around cannabis use, uh, and again, to just, you know, not necessarily going down the route of prohibiting it in multifamily housing, but at least making it a requirement for building owners to disclose whether they are a smoke-free building or not, and smoke meeting both products, tobacco and cannabis. So I'm going to put that out there. Councilmember Lohman. And I'd go even a step further, uh, even with the uh, with our residential housing as well. I think you've got a right to know if uh, somebody has uh, smoked in your uh, your property that you're about to acquire. So, um, but yeah, no, I still support that, and uh, hope that other members would be uh, interested in that. I would support it as something to take a look into. I mean, I, that, that's a, a novel approach that I hadn't thought of in the past, and. Wondering how it works, especially I can see how it worked with condominiums where you're purchasing, but for uh, an apartment building that turns over, it would be difficult, I think, to yeah to to, to be able to say yes or no. The person on either side of you, or the, the the apartment, the rental unit on either side of you, somebody smokes in that. That might be a challenge. Yeah. Um, but I'd be I'd be curious to learn more. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Council, if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion and a second to adjourn tonight's meeting. No further council discussion on this. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thanks much for the council. Good discussion tonight on a variety of different topics. Thank you very much. Thank you to the staff for your outstanding presentations and very clear explanations on things. Everybody tuning in, thank you much. Have a good rest of your day. We'll see you next week. Or not.